Welcome back, friends, to another episode of the Zephcast, the show where we get to know your favorite content creators, streamers, and podcasters alike. I am your host, Zephyrs XP, and with me today, we got my awesome friend and Twitch streamer, Agaskun JP. Thank you so much for being here tonight, today, this morning. August, how's your morning going so far today? Thank you so much for having me. The morning is going good. I just actually came home because I, I work on a different, in a different city on Saturday. So yeah. I just came back now. No. So I'm very awake. I'm good. <laughs> coffee already? Yeah, actually, no, I'm not a coffee person. <clears throat> More, do you yeah. drink tea a lot? Tea, I, I drink tea, yes. What's your favorite <laughs> kind of tea out of curiosity? Um, actually, I was not a tea person before I, I was living in the UK and then I became kind of a little bit of a tea person. And then since I came to Japan, I drink a lot of oolong tea. I don't know if you know that Ooh, one. Yeah, yeah. Oolong is del absolutely delicious tea. Yeah, I like it a lot. But I drink any anything like when it comes to tea. Yeah. We have a, like a huge in our cupboard. We have like a ton of different tea, like different white teas and oolong teas and black teas and green teas. So we just we go crazy for tea all the time. Um, I've heard a couple friends say it's pretty common around the world to add like milk to tea. Are you a, a milk tea fan or do you just drink it straight? I I thought that was it's not common in in the states. I thought that was everywhere. <laughs> it's not like I I've heard so many people I've met around the world who are just like yeah like we we always drink our tea with milk and I'm like what? At least not in the U.S. I, I, most people I've talked to usually drink their tea just straight with just water. I drink it straight, but I have drank it with milk too. <laughs> it's not rare. It's not rare. When I've talked to some of my friends about it, like tea with milk, they just give me the craziest look. Like, are you kidding? And I'm like, no, I swear. Like, this is, we're the weird ones in the world. It's very common elsewhere <laughs> in the world. Um, yeah, I can't imagine if you never seen it. I, my problem is like shocking. It's those kind of things like you have never seen this kind of food and then you see it and this. <laughs> oh yeah. And then it becomes addicting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's how it was with marzipan for a little bit. Um, so usually I like to start the podcast off right away with a little bit of a fun icebreaker question. You think you're ready for the icebreaker, August? I bring it, bring it. All right. I thought this one was an interesting one. If given a one time round trip time machine offer, would you rather travel in the past or travel in the future? And to what point? This is so unfair. Like why one time only? <laughs> you could come round, round trip, so you can come back if you want, but like just future or just past oh gosh okay as much as i would love to see the dinosaurs i have to say future future yes how far in the future I, 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 um well this is risky right because we might kill each other in, in like 100 years and then i i pop up in 1000 and there is nothing <laughs> just like the Quite disappointing. planet earth <laughs> But, but uh, I think like 1,000 years would be like something like I want to see, like 1,000 years, yeah. Like 1, 100 years. seems like still like short, like, you know, probably many of the things are familiar with what I don't know, but in 1,000 years, really, technology would be like, wow, it, something it, incredible. It's even crazy when you look like 100 years in the past, like there's stuff from 100 years ago, like if we brought a smartphone or a computer or any technology gadget we have now like a hundred years in the past it would be like witchcraft or sorcery or magic it's like what how is this thing working and even when you go back a thousand years like oh man it would just it, people would think you're a god being or something I, yes 100 percent will be that yeah I bet, I bet so i want to be like that <laughs> i bet that's kind of how like if aliens ever landed on earth and had like that advanced technology I feel like humans would also kind of look at them the same way, you know, like magic or what is this advanced technology of some kind? Yeah, um, I listen to science podcast because I'm a scientist. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I like about, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, he always says like, um, like for, for aliens, probably if the aliens visit Earth, we are just, they would not be interested in in us like almost at all like they would be we would be like i don't know like ants monkeys or like ants yeah like right. even less than monkeys like ants something like that so yeah 
Um, I've heard that. Which I completely don't agree with that. I think they would be interested in us because, you know, as a scientist, I use a lot of like bacteria and cells. So I'm very interested in those, but I don't think they would be interested in us like to make friends. Right, right. (laughs) Like probably, yeah, our language is not the same. (laughs) Kind of like if you found the smartest anteater out there or whatever, and like the (laughs) smartest one, the best one, and try to have a conversation about physics with them, they would just have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, I, I actually very much agree. Like, I think they would still be interested in observing us the same way we are about butterflies and trees and monkeys and ocean particles. Like we're super fascinated with everything. So I imagine they would as well be, but yeah, uh, maybe they're so far advanced. They wouldn't even be able to have like basic one-on-one communication with us. Yeah, bro. I, I mean, I hope they are kind, the kind ones come here and then they teach us many things. <laughs> Don't kill us, please. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, if you if you really want to go grim, like you can think about how many human beings, you know, to like ant hills or whatever. Do people just step on them? Do they help them and assist them? Do they completely ignore them? Yeah. So just the same way we look at ants, there could be other beings who feel similarly to us as well. They could squish us. They could blow us up. They could pass on by us and be like, oh, look at these monkeys that are still not quite there. We'll come back in like a hundred thousand years and see how how much better they're doing so yeah super fascinating yeah i love all those like thinking about like extraterrestrial life and all those things <laughs> i really like it uh, yeah i'm the same we spend my wife and i almost ev- like almost every night we're either watching like a tv show or like space documentaries or like science documentaries we were talking before the podcast started about kurt kurt Stigat. Can never pronounce the name correctly, but well, I don't know how to. Pro- I say Corsistans or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce. What's so funny about their name, though, is I don't think like anybody pronounces it correctly. But when you try to pronounce it, like everybody who knows who they are, like understand. You're like, do you know Kurds? Oh yeah, Kurds. Yeah, exactly. I love them. Yes, yes, yeah. It's it's one of these things like I really like because people tell you like, oh, you have to think about your brand and like catchy name and by they don't have a catchy name at all like you know it's impossible to pronounce it but they are so successful right so yeah i like to think like sometimes you know talent overcomes bad naming <laughs> oh 100 percent. i mean i think the quality of you know a company's or a person's content and the amount of just next level ability that they can put into something that will always triumphant like quality if it's if it's super on par it'll get out there. People will discover. People will eventually find it. Um, Maybe they could have gotten farther if they had like a more catchy name, but I don't know. It's kind of like um, the the Casey Neistat's of the world and, you know, the PewDiePie's of the world. They just have such their brand is is like elevated to almost over like pop culture, you know? Yeah, I think probably like in, in German might be like a catchy name. Uh, I think it's related to, uh, to to science, actually, how you say science in German. Yeah. Um, so might be catchy, but then I guess they became so popular that it was too late to like change the name anymore. Like, it, right. like they became very popular in English too. So yeah. I feel like that would I be, love the videos. I feel like that would be a, you know, content creators, one of their worst nightmares, things that could happen. Like they kind of start getting a leg up with a brand or a particular name or an idea. And then just down the road, they want to completely pivot and change to something entirely different but they already have this whole following behind them like do they change their brand do they start over do they rebrand like kind of you know and i've talked to some streamers about that as well when it comes to like their names and stuff and you know you can always change your name and change your brand and everything but there is almost like an image that you've put hours into that you've paid for you know with emotes or with logos and it's yeah i've kind of thought of that sometimes myself of like do I want to be this Zephyr's XP person forever? Like maybe change it down the road. Maybe it should stick. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe like names don't matter at all. And it's just the person behind the name and the content behind the person, you know? Yeah, I think if you change your brand, you will suffer. Not you particularly, like I guess anyone would suffer like a little bit, but I guess after a while, it just goes back to normal, I'm assuming. 
Um, yeah, because I also think about my name, like, oh, I want to keep it like that. Like, uh, should it change it? Not that I can change it for anything I want because all of them are taken, but. <laughs> right. That's the other struggle is like always trying to find before you started Twitch and kind of had like a, a name or like an idea for your content. Did you go to those like username generators and type your name in and see where it was available at? Uh, I, I knew I wanted to go to school, so mm -hmm. it was not available, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then I decided, like, you know, I, as a part of my brand, I think, like, what is going to be my channel about? And I would say, like, you know, I live in Japan. That's like, pretty cool, pretty unique. So I just said, like, you know, JP. And then it's like Japan. So um, that's how I was going to came. But if I ever become partner, I heard like if you become partner, you can change your name easier. So yeah. I might, I might transition into Agus Kun. Um, because someday I might leave Japan and then I'm afraid it's not going to be like any meaningful to have JP anymore in the name. I don't know. I mean, maybe, <laughs> I mean, maybe it even transcends being in a particular place. Like the person you are right now at this point in time who started this Twitch and started every, all of your content started in Japan. So, I mean, even if you move, you still have that cemented character, that whole memory and history of what it, where it all started ingrained deep within your brand and your characters. So maybe it will always be there, you know, regardless where you move. You, yeah, you are right. Because even if I leave Japan, I think that's going to be part of my personality forever now. So, yeah. Speaking of moving, um, I know that you're kind of in the process of moving right now. How's the whole move and the whole everything been? Um, when can we expect our next uh, August stream out of curiosity? So I have been streamed for like 10 days, I think. Uh, I think it's one of the longest uh, breaks. I wasn't expecting it to be so long, but the moving is actually like it's been very busy like as you i'm apologizing for the room like there is pretty That's much great. nothing uh <laughs> i love the chocobos that is like the best thing in the world i want that yeah that actually is supposed to go on the wall at some point but <laughs> like i'm hiding the ugly cable that you can actually see here because it's like i'm I, everyone i did a very good job with cable management uh i'm very proud of myself but still i need to bring the like ethernet from the living room and it's such a long cable and I didn't have time to fix that one. So I apologize yeah. for that one. <laughs> and this is more, it's gonna change soon. So the, the movie is still going, but I think I'm gonna stream tonight, even if it's a short, just chatting stream because it's been a long time. And now thanks to you, I got set up the camera and the microphone. So I think I'm ready. <laughs> so I have to thank you for like giving me that deadline of like, this week I need to have it set up. <laughs> kind, of, kind of the push of like okay we gotta we gotta do it yeah <laughs> yeah moving is uh when i moved from i used to stream on my macbook and then when i got my pc and moved everything over to it it was it was super frustrating it was very educational to kind of like reset everything back up um and I, I, don't, I don't know if you made backups for all of your stream stuff, but I ended up like resetting up literally everything and it was a nightmare and it took forever, but it, but it was nice. Like, I think it's nice to always start fresh, do spring cleaning when you have an opportunity and just kind of throw some stuff away, reset back up the background, kind of reset it all up and kind of get a whole new look to it. So were you kind of feeling that you're like, I had this whole setup before and now everything's new. Where do I put what, where goes where? Are you kind of feeling that? I'm 100% feeling that like um, I have the same shelf that I had in the other like room, but I want to rearrange because now I just realized like the camera can see the floor, which before it couldn't. Um, I don't know if I'm going to change the camera position later. Like I want to see, I have the PC here. Like I want people to see the PC because it's one of those like flashy PCs. Like, oh yeah. I think you can see like. Ooh, RGB. Yeah. So, um, I want people to see that a little bit. I want to hang the chocobots at some point somewhere. <laughs> and then I would, I would love to have some lights like the ones you have behind and uh, illuminate also the shelf because when it's dark, you cannot properly see what is in the sh on, like inside the shelf. So I want to do those things. Um, I have a lot of ideas, but it's, I'm going to take it step by step because I get really stressed. And I don't know if you have heard this, but you have heard, like, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yes. So I do that all the time. Like, if something is not 
like it should be like in my head like the perfection image it never happens and then i've been already working on that several years and i'm trying to do like you know even if it's not perfect let's let's do it <laughs> that's so how... yeah i'm very excited a lot of um i've been reading like a lot of like self-help books and productivity books and stuff like that and listening to podcasts and audiobooks about that and a lot of them talk about that like if you're so focused dead center on like being a perfectionist it'll just it, i think they say like perfectionism is the thief of of good enough or something like that kind of what you were saying and yeah you'll just never get started you'll always be in this like analysis paralysis of like always trying to like i, I gotta get better i gotta do more i gotta get a better setup i need better lights i can't stream with the, this camera i need another webcam and it kind of sometimes has driven me a little crazy like hearing some people who are like i really want to stream and i want to be a streamer but i gotta get the pc and upgrade this and i gotta get the camera and it's like if you got a console or you got a even a really old pc you can you can still make it work you just gotta Go up, like get OBS go in or log into your Twitch account on your PS4 and, and just go with it, you know? I think we are actually like um, examples of that, like you and me probably, because you said you started in your, like, on your Mac. And I started, I don't know if you remember, but I started doing like remote play from my PS4 into yeah. my laptop. It was horrible. But you did <laughs> Like it. my first stream. But I did it. I started, and that pushed me to like you know keep on improving. I got the PC. Uh, now I have like capture cards. So you know, little by little, I've been like kind of improving the stream, the quality. So yeah, like I think it's good to start even if you don't have the perfect equipment or like the perfect idea. Or, like yeah. Spoiler alert for everybody out there: it's never perfect. If you're doing a stream setup, you will always want different lights or change the setup or a whole different vibe you'll want a different camera like you're always going to want to upgrade and, and push stuff and i mean even in a lot of things in life like you're always you're never stationary you're always moving forward and if you just wait for a perfect moment to come it, it just never will come and and you know it's like i want to climb this mountain but i don't want to take the first step you got to take the first step to eventually climb the mountain and let me say something that is very like cliche but i feel it's like really good like as long as you are enjoying the journey like i feel like um i don't know like if you don't really enjoy like improving your stream it's gonna be tough for you to like do this stream journey like uh if we are talking about streaming but it could be applied to anything but like i don't know in my case like i don't know if you heard of lear and bold like to to yeah. like yeah so i love lear and bold it's really complicated uh it is. and um but I really like enjoy like figuring out how to use it. So even if it takes time and it's like very slow improvement, I enjoy the process a lot. So at the end of the day, I'm happy like with how things are going, like my day, how I'm using my time and everything. But if on the other hand, I just, I just want to do this and I need to rush it, I would feel like the stress of it. But I think if you enjoy the process of it, it's much better for your mental health. And at the end of the day, for like your improvement, because you won't get burned or like tired of it right so yeah yeah it, it's it's almost like some people just are, are searching for that hundred percent but you got to get like getting one percent better each day will get you there it might not come tomorrow it might take a month or two months or six months or a year or multiple years but like just take it one percent better each day maybe change something different about your stream setup or move something or just add something small or maybe download leorn board or look into like a new widget or an extension or something and just like keep trying new things keep changing settings keep just trying to figure out things a little bit differently for your setup and yeah i mean you'll, you'll figure it out you just gotta you just gotta take that first step i think yeah i'm i'm very like fan of like I think related with what you said, like doing like, I have a, a list of things I have to do, like uh, for work, for like personal life and for streaming. And I try to like, you know, like always do something once one thing per week minimum. If I can do more, great. If not, but do like a small thing. Like I'm going to try to, I don't know, like create a new emote or like I'm going to try to like um, make a new command in Lear and Board. So at least I can say like, there is like a little improvement somewhere. So I try to, do. sometimes it's difficult, but I, I recommend to everyone try that um, kind of style of 
especially if you're a questioner like me, like I question everything. So I need like an, an analysis paralysis is reality in my life because I need a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I need to be sure I have all the information to make the right decision. But sometimes you have to, I write a deadline, like I say, okay, I'm going to decide what to do by Friday, regardless of how much information I have, because yes. otherwise I keep on going. A deadline, a deadline. <laughs> yes. I'm kind of the same Personal. way about like needing information. I'm very similar like that, but I'll also need it from like multiple people and multiple sources. So if I'm like looking up reviews for something or, or just trying to figure something out, someone might say it one way, but then I'll maybe read a different article or watch a different video just to hear it a different perspective perspective. And sometimes I feel like, yeah, you're just getting more information that's taking up more time when maybe you should just kind of, you know, press down on the gas and get going essentially. I we love video games. So one thing I'm struggling, like um <laughs> not actually I haven't played I haven't touched any console or PC for gaming in like 10 days. So this is I don't recognize myself, but um I'm gonna be back soon. <laughs> but before I started the moving, I just finished um Life is Strange um mm -hmm. before the storm. So that's something I was playing off stream. I play very little off stream, but I try to play like one game at least off stream a little bit. And when I finished, literally, I spent like two days just thinking what game should I play next? And it's analysis paralysis because I like watching reviews, which one is good, like how long it takes, like meta score, and yeah, like. <laughs> yeah. Um... I, I have been watching a couple streamers play Life is Strange and it looks really, really cool, honestly. I think I love the like animation and the, the graphic style and the art in it. I feel like I keep saying that about like every game nowadays. Like there's so many games where just the art style and just everything. I don't know if we've reached a, a pinnacle of video games, but just there's been so many games that have came out that have just been absolutely phenomenal. Do you kind of feel sometimes with all these amazing games, you just kind of are like, I don't know what one to play that you almost have like such a long list of games you want to play, but you just don't know which one to jump into. I don't have my bullet journal here, unfortunately. I have it in the living room, but I have a backlog in my bullet journal. And um, <laughs> it's really stressful. Yeah. <laughs> because I think we live, uh, well, first of all, I, I have, I, I stopped playing games like for like 10 years when I was like university student and living in the UK. Like, I guess my social life was way too demanding. So <laughs> I didn't play games. But then I came to Japan and it all started with a Nintendo 3DS. I got a Nintendo 3DS and from there it escalated into PS4, now PS5, PC, so Switch. It's kind of so, like the, uh, um, the taste, right? The entry. Yeah, the Nintendo 3DS was the entry with the Pokemon, Pokemon game. And imagine, I had like 10 years of hiatus that I didn't play any game, so there are many games I want to play from that period. And then also the new games, like, we live in an amazing time because so many games are released every year and so many good games. Like, last year was Hades, like, yeah. I don't know, like, I played the last year God of War, which was from 2018, but I played last year. Um, the Witcher 3, I had, like, a plenty of games that I was playing and then Sekiro. trying to catch up with a new one. It's just... And Life is Strange, I love it. It's quite very, it's very different, mm -hmm. different type of game compared with what uh i normally play but i just bought life is strange too yeah <laughs> so i guess i'm playing that one at some point <laughs> so yeah i love that there's so many different styles of games too you know like god of war is so very much different than life is strange and which is so different than hollow knight and that's so different than hades and there's just like there, there's so many different uh just different genres of games i really believe that there's definitely a game out there or a genre of game for everybody like it's it's deep buried within us that there are wh whether it's like i don't know animal crossing or minecraft or halo or like there's a genre out there for everybody even if you're candy not, crush i was gonna say candy crush if you're <laughs> eight years old you know or however old you know, play candy crush um there's definitely something out there for everybody i believe yeah um and and that's something like you know people are really judgmental like and i've been there you know like trying like oh you play that like yeah. maybe with Candy Crush, I might have done it. But then I just feel like, oh, let people play whatever they enjoy, you know, like right. whatever it works for them. Like um, every person is kind of different. Um, I think for me, what it clicks a lot is 
kind of the RPG like um, it, when it comes to Life is Strange it's like decision making like feeling that what the decisions I'm, I'm taking in the story is going to affect the story right. so which is part of the RPG too like many RPGs like the, like the Witcher have like this kind of like depending on what you choose or like Mass Effect you will have a different ending so I think that's the thing that click the most for me but recently we've been both playing Dark Souls for example yes. and, uh, <laughs> uh, I just enjoy the despair and suffering I guess because <laughs> so true <laughs> you know, no but actually finishing a boss makes makes you like really happy inside it's like yes finally yes. <laughs> I, I feel like the Soulsborne games are very much like a roller coaster where you have to have these very low lows that just make you rage make you frustrated make you upset and because you have such low lows then you can experience the crazy highs that come from defeating a boss you've been trying to beat for hours or you know 20 30 40 attempts and when you finally get it it's i haven't ever felt anything like it ever playing a video game before like every time the, the biggest one for me was ornstein and smau and dark souls one after finally beating them after like 30 attempts and like two or three streams worth of trying to fight them it was just the best feeling in the world i wanted to jump up and flip my table over and just be like yes but yeah i haven't really felt that way about any other game where you just get so frustrated but because you have that frustration you can have these crazy intense yeah these crazy intense highs from it and and it's not as story focused i know some people will say the soulsborne games have like they do have amazing stories, especially like Bloodborne and stuff. They have like really great stories and, and Sekiro, but they're not as in your face, you know, as like Final Fantasy or the Tales games or God of War or whatever. So I, I think kind of that great story hidden in the background, it, it can kind of appeal to like a different, a different <laughs> genre of gamer, you know? They are not on your face at all. Like for me, these kind of games is games that I understand once I go to YouTube and watch a video. <laughs> because otherwise I can I don't I don't I don't get what's happening really much in the game. So when I finish Dark Souls 3, I will go and see what was happening from Dark Souls 1 to Dark Souls 3 of the story. I did that with Bloodborne too. Like of course I could understand some things, but um not by any extent what was explained to me in the in the videos like so yeah it's not like definitely like a final fantasy or like witcher game at all so but but yeah. what you say is, is very true i think like i was reading like kind of research and um don't believe what i say this is out of my memory it might be wrong but they said something like actually like happiness the people who are happier is the people who actually are not happy all the time Kind of, it was something yeah. like, you know, you are like kind of having a happy moment and then it, it goes back. But if you have like some like continuous like exposure to happiness, like say like, I don't know, like a game, like uh, it's good all the time and doesn't have any struggle, then it will become kind of boring at some right. point and then it's not fun anymore. So I think with Dark Souls, it's kind of like that, like you are so low and then the heights go very high. So yeah, when I read that, I was like, this is what happened in Dark Souls, totally. For sure. <laughs> and, and I feel like with the stories too, one of the things that makes them so great is after I beat Bloodborne, I was kind of like you, I'm like, I have some idea what the story is. I kind of have some vague interpretation of it. But when I watched lore videos afterwards, and then went back and played it again there were so many things where i was like oh i get that i get that i get that. like everything just clicked together and it became way cooler of a game somehow and uh yeah i completely agree and and the other point you were saying is i i feel there's something about i don't know something humanity based about the struggle of life sometimes you know in a very broad sense kind of stemming from like a simple dark souls game and getting much broader and more philosophical like there is something to be said about the struggle that we all go through in life no matter what it is if you have more of that struggle sometimes when you actually get that payoff and get what you've been pushing after it's just so much sweeter versus something that was just simply given to you like easy mode having that struggle and having that that drive day after day after day can make that victory so much sweeter sometimes yes um yeah i totally agree like for me like the key would be like when it comes to life 
So I don't like when people say like, you know, when people are struggling and then they, they tell you like, oh, but you will be stronger after this. I don't like that narrative much <laughs> because it almost make it look like the struggle is necessary for you to be a better person, which I don't believe. But I really like, how would you say like, manageable struggles are actually really good for your life because you go through like, you learn something new, you learn new skills, like you have to like kind of, push yourself to your limits and if it's manageable as long as it doesn't create any like you know mental stress like or at least like nothing like will be pretty bad for your mental health mm -hmm. i think it's good um but um yeah but like um in this case for example it's games <clears throat> because it's games you can leave it anytime you want it's something we enjoy doing so i think this struggle is actually something that could be really enjoyable like um in the Souls games, like, you struggle a lot, but then, you know, it's something that is not related with your life. You can live at any given moment. Um, uh, you can enjoy the process uh, if you may. So I have a question for you yeah, related yeah, yeah. to this one, because there is a lot of controversy uh, about this. So there are people who say, like, Dark Souls games should never have an easy mode. And some mm. people say, like, oh, it doesn't take anything from the people, you know, having an easy mode, you can still play it in hard mode. So what do you think about this? I... Oh, that, that is, you know, I, I really see both sides of it. Like I do understand the idea of where the developers are coming from. Whereas if it is one set difficulty, everybody takes on the same challenge together. And some people will not be able to complete the challenge, whether it's for like personal reasons or physical reasons, emotional, mental, they, they just can't push through it. And some people will be able to, to accomplish it. And I, I almost kind of mirror it to like a professional sport no matter how much you desperately want to become like a basketball player in the NBA, you, there are some people who just are not going to be able to do it. You know, you have to have that jumper, you have to have the height, you have to have the athleticism a lot of the times. And just some people, no matter what, just aren't going to be able to get there. But on the flip side, I also fully understand the other argument that I think by having an easy mode, having different levels of difficulties, opens it up to everybody to be able to experience so it's almost like do you want 80 percent of people to be able to beat it and to exclude you know a certain amount of other people and just like all these people went through the same challenge together they all have like this camaraderie this this brotherhood or just like we did it all together or do you want everybody to be able to do it i don't know i really don't know i don't i i really understand both perspectives really fully I, you know kind of like the professional sports side of it as a mirror and then also just having everybody be able to experience it when it comes to the souls games in particular i feel like maybe if there was i don't know how to say this in like maybe they had more story if, if it, there were more of like a story focused thing and in your face thing they had just more because I feel with Soulsborne games, like 98% of the fun in it is the combat, the gameplay, the bosses, things that like everybody. I see you, Haas. I see you, Haas. Um, oh, we have Haas here? We have Haas here. We have the mighty Haas. Oh, thank you. Oh, boy. Um, on the flip thing. Um, oh, boy. They're, they're, they coming in hot. I think when it comes to that, though, like I, I do understand both, both perspectives. I, I don't really know if I can say... I'm pro this side or pro that side or whatever. I feel like I'm very much in the middle and that might be kind of a cop-out answer, but I feel like I do understand both perspectives. What about, what about you? I, 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 I'm not gonna criticize you and say like, that's a cop-out. No, like, uh, <laughs> because I feel like, like you pretty much. Um, I kind of, maybe I tilt a little bit towards having like options for everyone but um I, I strongly also like i think if there was a normal mode i would probably play in normal mode and now i feel like i enjoy much more playing like this hard mode the only mode yeah so i feel like yeah if there was that option maybe i wouldn't have had the souls experience which is the push. what it is right like yeah like so I don't know. I have. I, I. I think I relate with what you are saying pretty much. <laughs> you know what's, like I'm in the middle. You know what's so interesting is after playing through Bloodborne and the Souls games, um, a little 
bit of time ago i was offline i was playing final fantasy 7 remake on hard mode and i feel like playing the souls games made me just view video games almost in a different way i i noticed so many things about final fantasy 7 remake in hard mode that just felt cheap or not fair or too handholdy or like the there were benches everywhere there was like uh you know options to heal yourself everywhere and it's not like that at all in the Soulsborne games or at least to the same extent um and then I just I'm not to t not to go from Dark Souls to like Final Fantasy 7 remake but just kind of in a broad sense after playing through the Souls games I just I felt like I did appreciate that that harder difficulty and I don't know just the way the game almost like trusts you to to be free to make mistakes be free to die a ton of times before you kind of figure it out and i was really frustrated in the beginning with the games like that because i'm like there's no tutorial they don't really teach you much they show hidden vague messages on the ground about like how to attack but it's nothing like really they don't really kind of get in and, and teach you too much and now i actually really like that now when i play games i'm like oh can this tutorial end can i just get to the game and if i die like i die whatever i'll learn from it you know yeah um yeah so so what do you think like Final Fantasy seven remake hard mode wasn't hard enough is that what it is I, if we're if we're talking specifically about final fantasy 7 remake i just felt like hard mode was the idea of getting rid of items blocking out items yeah. but you still receive items from enemies but you just can't use them i just felt like that was a really cheap way of doing it in my humble opinion i would have much preferred if they had given you the option of like still using items that was still there but they just made the bosses and the enemies more difficult more health um i don't i don't, I don't know because maybe you could have spammed potions and ethers and just kind of like spam the items but maybe they could have limited the quantities of them a little bit more I'm not too sure, but I definitely noticed like benches everywhere or I don't know, just a little bit more hand holding in some places than I probably would have cared for. But they didn't give you MP. Right. True. True. But they did give health, health and you could almost <laughs> just constantly kind of like attack and then reheal and attack and reheal. Wow, you are hardcore now. Like I felt like Final Fantasy VII remake was actually hard in hard I'm mode. Not, oh, not, not saying not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying it's it wasn't hard because it was definitely challenging. Um, I still haven't. I'm still on like the last, actually the Sephiroth battle. Like when you go into the. Oh, I mean, spoiler alert for anybody. Oops. But whatever is the ending of the game, I still haven't beat that part yet. So I'm not saying it's not like difficult by any means. I just feel like I would have wanted there to be more difficult enemies and more difficult bosses while still being able to use the items um the other thing that kind of yeah. on a different tangent a little bit with seven remake another thing that kind of drove me crazy was how, the whole summoning materia and how you got summoning materia from chadley and in the original game it was so much more of like you find it in the earth you find it from people it's like much more of a like a, an NPC giving you to you kind of experience and and like Leviathan being in Midgar when that was such a tied materia to Yuffie's whole story that kind of like really turned me off a little bit and then when you got the materia it was fully mastered so there wasn't anywhere to level it up or maybe get like maybe you start with a one attack ability with Ifrit and then you level it up to the second level and you get a second attack and then maybe you get more attacks or a longer length I just kind of sometimes felt like some of the aspects were cheapened out just a little bit and if they had more leveling or more ways you could dive into it more to grow into it i felt like that could have made it a little bit better wow that's actually really interesting now i'm gonna take that opinion for myself too <laughs> like like i was thinking like the game was i i enjoyed my episode remake so much i did too i yes. i yeah I, i'm sure you did but now bit hearing your perspective is like um yeah actually that would make sense like you could level up like the summoning and then you they have like extra attacks or like extra like Lengthen. lands or something that yeah. would be actually yeah that would be very interesting maybe they we should we should email square enix and and send us for the second right, part. right. And I felt like, I, I don't know, like I noticed that right away when, when you uncovered like the first few materia and Chadley was giving it to you in the VR. I'm like, this just feels weird. And you fight Shiva and then you get Shiva's materia and it's fully maxed out and leveled. And yeah, I, I always thought it would just be really cool if it had its four or five levels. And then like every time you got to the next level, Shiva got like a second attack or then maybe got an ability or then maybe could cast Blizzaga or something. And then 
like every level up yeah just could have like 10 more seconds added to fighting with you on the battlefield maybe the ultimate attack at the end does a little bit more damage with each level up and there was a couple other materials too i think i think steel was one with yeah i think steel was one where there was like a steel i can't remember if it was but there were some of the materials where they were just maxed out right away or they didn't have much growth to them so i don't know i just was noticing that when i was playing it and i'm like I kind of missed that a little bit about the the OG and when you'd master a materia you would get an additional one for free and that wasn't in there as well and I'm like I'm I don't know I don't know maybe very nitpicking doesn't bring it down yeah, yeah, like yeah, a yeah. whole point or anything like that but there was just uh, Final Fantasy 7 remake uh, it, Final Fantasy 7 is my favorite game of all time Final Fantasy series is my favorite series like I'm very passionate about it and I, I felt like I've never been more mixed about a game because there was so many things that were so incredible and the music was amazing and the way the characters talked to each other. It was just amazing to hear them converse more and to get more life in it. But then there was other elements where I'm just like, oh man, that sh they should have cooked that longer or made, like when the models would just pop in randomly or I don't know, some of the battle mechanics or I just felt like some of the things could have used like an extra year worth of development, but... You know, you got to get that game out and get the money as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, yes, I, 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 I think probably that's why also they chopped into different parts because probably no, like, no company can afford to develop a game for like fifteen years. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I <laughs> so they, they that. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I enjoyed the game uh, thoroughly. Like, I, I obviously. Think that there would be some cool things of improvement now that you said like about the mastering material also like, my biggest disappointment was replaying the game and not getting another uh the all, all material all material? yes yes i was like what <laughs> no right when i beat the game uh, for, like right after I beat the game and you had chapter select the very first place I went was I think chapter 8 where you get one of those because I'm like oh I need to get one of these for everybody and it wasn't there and then I started googling I'm like can we not get a second one uh, that was heartbreaking <laughs> yeah but I actually kind of understand that if you get many of those probably the, the battle would be broken yeah. so it would be way easier probably um uh, but they, they I don't know if you did you play the you DLC you did I right did, yeah yeah and I think they, which one is, there is one of the blue materials that has been like improved and now it's way stronger. Like uh, the one that when you make a spell, your friends, your partners will make another spell too. Like, oh, like a copycat with that one. kind of, right? Yeah. And apparently that, that, that one, basically I used it with um, uh, Aerith and oh my God, she's just like, killing everyone on site just with that material you know it's funny i think in uh final fantasy 7 remake Aerith with like the right materia combination is the most powerful character in the whole game like you'd think cloud would be or, or i mean maybe tifa could be like on a dps per second basis but yeah Aerith with her right wand and her you know like the materia packed in her oh yeah she she's a beast she i mean she's always been a beast though yes and I, I'm very happy they are making justice to like every single character in their way. Like Tifa just feels so good to play with her, like punching oh, yeah. everyone. Aerith just like the the spells are so powerful. Cloud changing between the stances of like um like this kind of Sephiroth style or like um Sack style. It's like a deck style and a strength style almost. Like yeah, the souls and, in us. Uh, <laughs> yeah like i I'm, i can't wait to see how are they gonna do the other characters and i hope they do like in in jeffy dlc like they they there we have more combos between the, the characters like they can yeah. play with each other so i hope there is more of that i hope so too um i almost feel like they were testing like sid's spear attack or how like a a, a spear character would be by having Oh, what was his name? It, it, with, it, Sonon. With Sonon, yes, with Yuffie in there. It was almost like, we're not quite sure maybe how we're going to have Sid fight, so maybe we can have this other character and just kind of test it a little bit, see how people like it. I liked him as a character. I was... During when I was playing it, I'm like, I feel like it's got to be right. I won't talk spoilers or anything that happens, but how the character ended the DLC, it felt... I, I thought it was done very well. I liked him a lot as a character. 
I was not invested so much in the story because I didn't play the chop servers. Mm. Um, spoiler alert, is related to that. <laughs> <laughs> related only, like you. you. Um, but um, I was like, oh, is it going to be interesting for me? But actually, I really enjoyed it a lot, and I, I like that they are using all the everything that has been written or said about Final Fantasy VII seems to be involved in this new creation, so I like that too. The whole compilation versus like just the OG game. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, uh, I hope we get more stuff about it soon because I just, I'm, I'm waiting for a new teaser or something, the end of the Yuffie DLC. Ooh, I was, I was so excited for, that was amazing. Me too, yes. Um, they keep on teasing us. <laughs> Square Enix is so good at, or maybe I should say so bad at that. One thing that actually kind of drives me a little <laughs> bit crazy about Square Enix is so many other game developers, it seems like will already have their game. I don't know, 15, Haas is at it again. I see you Haas, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I, I know- noticed... We can't talk about how Twitch is handling Haas problem right, too. Right, right, that's a whole another story in and of itself. The whole Twitch handling of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I just, I really like Final Fantasy VII. I can't wait to see what they do with it. One thing though, that just kind of drives me a little bit crazy about Square Enix is they'll almost like announce the game when they have an idea of it. And then they'll, um, like still have five to seven years of development for it. Whereas other game companies, they'll essentially have like 80%, like 50 to 80% of the game done. And then they'll announce it. Um, FromSoft did that a little bit with Elden Ring. They did announce the cinematic trailer a few years back, kind of saying like we were going to make this game. Um, but then recently when they unveiled the trailer, everyone was like, oh, it looks so good. And they're like, by the way, six months from now, it's going to be coming out. So I don't know. I, I don't know what the the right way is to, to go about that. Um, I did. The, um, or sorry, what were we saying? No, like, yeah, like um, when was that? I was fine for the seven remake. Like, uh, was like 2013 <laughs> yeah when they first announced it that first trailer that everyone was like so excited in the e3 like oh my god um yeah so it's been like seven years what six years so yeah that was that was a long wait there <laughs> yeah i hope we don't have to wait a similar amount of time for part two. Oh, i wonder how far along they are with it i see square enix now we need the stuff now <laughs> give us the <laughs> I'm willing to wait if it's a uh, high quality like the first part. Like um, I'm very excited about how where the game is going because you know there are many theories and things. So um, if if it's good quality, I'm happy to wait. But maybe not seven years. Yeah. <laughs> Completely agree. Can we have it to 2023 20, the maximum? I, I think it was um, Miyamoto. I want to say who did uh, Legend of Zelda. I, I I could be wrong on the quote from from it but i believe it was him who was saying like a bad game will always be bad whereas a good game like even if you take time on the good game um once it comes out people will appreciate it for the time you spent on it so don't rush a game like just to get it out there like give a game time and, and attention and love to it and when it comes out people will be ecstatic that it's out Cyberpunk 2077. Oh yeah. Were you pretty you were a pretty <laughs> big fan of Witcher, right? Witcher 3. You played that. Right? I was, yeah. I, I like um I have um, in my bullet journal I have also like uh we my backlog when I finish a game I rate them. So I have yeah. the meta score and then I have the Agus score. Ah. So the Witcher 3 is one of the very few games to get a 10 out of 10. Really? The Witcher 3. So I, that's how much I love that game. Like, it's a little bit unfair, I must say, because it's one of the first games I played after my like 10 years not playing games. So obviously for me, like the graphics, everything was like, wow. Like, you know, I, I, the last thing I played was probably Kingdom Hearts 2. Yeah. So I was like, what is this? And I was so excited. So it was 10 out of 10. I loved it. Also. So like I put 160 hours. I remember seeing 160 hours and in my head, it was like 30. Like yeah. it, it just was so fast. So um, I loved it so much that I was even though like cyber, Cyberpunk is not like kind of like shooters. First person shooters is one of those games that I not enjoy like so much. Like I can play, but it's not my cup of tea kind of game. Yeah. yeah. So I was not like, you know, oh, but let's give it a go because it's like, you know, CD Projekt, uh, let's try. Um, 
Oh man, I was so disappointed. And did you play it on PC it, or on PS4? PC, PC, PC. PC. So uh, it wasn't that bad. It was bad. I had glitches and um, so now I'm actually I stopped playing and I'm waiting for like um, a few like couple of years and then I will I guess I will play at that point. So. Yeah, but it was really disappointing, especially because I have very strong opinions about um, things, and those things were related with why this this uh, release happened. And I just don't know. I I think in this case, for me, like you know, you can have your own company models, but this was clearly a game that was not ready to be released. So right. they they lied basically pretty much because they really they could have said like you know. We are very sorry. The game is going to be released in PC, but not in console yet. Right. You have to wait six months. Something like that. I don't know. Well, and I'm sure people, it's what you said. People would understand, but that would mean like losing out of money. So right. that's, they, they waited and then they decided to release. So yeah. It's, video games are in this just weird category. And I feel like movies are kind of in there as well. Just like a lot of media is where you almost have to like corporatize it and a lot of these projects like these huge games like god of war and, and you know C cyberpunk and the witcher 3 and final fantasy like these these are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects like the people think video games you know back in the day they could make them for a couple million dollars and you can still do that with some like indie games and stuff um and some for even less than that but like the mag the huge ones the behemoths of the industry you know the god of wars and red dead redemption and and these are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects and and years like it takes five plus years sometimes to get these from an idea to an actual game in hand um sometimes even longer than that and so it is this weird middle ground where you need these gigantic sums of money that only you know the the big and the the shareholders and the rich and the elites like they're the ones that have that money and they need the extremely creative artists to kind of somehow find and merge that together so yeah i I'm, i feel like we're probably very similar in our feelings about cd project red and the whole cyberpunk fiasco of like they had an amazing idea and probably an amazing game still in there like still buried in there that the developers were working on and these grandiose ideas for it but it was just the shareholders and the executives saying we need money you've had this much money put into it you've had this long to do it you've already had a couple push-offs and and uh pushing back the dates we need this game out now and we need to make our money back on it and it was just it it just happened i i almost I don't know what the solution is to that M more so maybe like the game director at the helm has to have the final say as to when it finalizes is you know and just or like the project finishes up um and and take the brunt if he says you know we have to push it back six months or another year or another two years but then where do they get the money from and then does the whole thing crash and burn and then they lose all the money it's a weird really weird position to be in yeah, I guess like there is no like right, like, you know, I'm talking from the player point of view, like, right. I, I don't know how the relationship actually works in real life, but and one one solution is like, I, I wouldn't actually, maybe you can have like a deadline for the shareholders or whatever, but I wouldn't announce a deadline for the players. Like when the game is like such a yeah. big um, project, I wouldn't even say when the game is going to be released. You could say like, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be something between two and four years and play with that. But the problem with Cyberpunk is like, it was announced everywhere, like uh, right. for like one, like one year, it was going to be April last, last year. And then it became like November, I think. So um, it was announced like very long time ago. So yeah, I, maybe don't having like those public release dates. And then like what, um, what is it called? Hollow Knight? Uh, Yes. Song, Silk, Silk Song, songs. Yes. Song. They, they haven't it. said anything. Right. We are all like, but I think people are happy to wait. Like, because Hollow Knight was such a good game and they know, like, they want to get a quality game again. Yeah. And even if the company is not saying anything, yeah, I'm sure there are some people, there are people who are going to be always angry, say, like, why don't you say release day? But, you know, those are the minority. I think we are all happy to, like, you know, give us the game when it's ready. I completely agree. Unless, 
unless it's like 20 40 then maybe rush a little bit but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah and i feel like there's there's no shortage of good games like people have so many games from years ago from generations that they could play of super nintendo and and playstation one and playstation two and like there's still such a huge backlog of games to play um by by pushing it out and not giving a time frame i actually really like that a lot i think that's a fantastic idea where maybe they can announce the game and say hey we're working on hollow knight silk song there's gonna be a game for it it'll come in the next couple years be very vague with it and then i don't know i, I feel like the best way to go about it maybe would be like when the game is done and the only thing we're waiting on is publishing and marketing and like that stuff but the actual game is done then we can announce a release date of like six it, it, it's in six months or something like that yeah like and, and, like i think kindness goes a long way in everything so like for example if cyberpunk comes and it has a lot of bugs you know i would try to be just kind and say like you know this game is huge so right. bugs are bound to happen at some point like you right. know like games are not like they used to be like just like lines of code like now there yeah. are like millions of line of code so it's really hard to have a perfect product so um or it's not like a movie that you can watch and watch the movie and say like okay it looks good the game you know there are thousands of people playing different ways trying to break the game right. so things are gonna happen so i'll try to be kind but cyberpunk was not buggy it was just not ready 100 <laughs> percent agree. so I, um yeah i even felt a little bit of that not to go back again this final fantasy 7 remake but just like briefly it playing it on playstation 5 versus playing it on ps4 the whole even the whole time i was playing it on ps4 i'm like i feel like this was a game designed for the playstation 5 in mind and for some reason maybe the shareholders maybe they were like you know what this game could look still really good we can kind of downscale it to the ps4 and then just have the ps5 and forward be like the actual console to play it on because if you play it on ps4 to ps5 not only is the frame rate so much better but the graphics are incredible a lot of those ridiculously long loading chunks of time just immediately disappear it just feels like it was a, a ps5 game that was downscaled to a ps4 game more than it was a ps4 game upscaled to a ps5 game you know did you see the like the door there is something like i was talking about the door with like carrie and cranberry and some other people yes. i was like did you see the door and they were like what door and i was like the door like the bedroom door <laughs> like it looks it looks like a ps2 ps2 game yes. door yes. i was like it doesn't make no but the characters i think the characters were so beautiful that it was pushing the ps4 to the limits to just create the characters so i for me like the last of us 2 and Final fantasy 7 remake were the two games that i was this is pushing my ps4 to the limit now because yeah. it's just so beautiful and yeah this is this is a whole new conversation what you said like um i have a friend who is actually like um very against consoles like he's not a console person because he said all the time like consoles are holding games back like kind of like you know like um because game developers they want to make as much money as they want to sell the game in many platforms so right. you know they would release in like ps4 like last generation platform when they could release in ps5 or even in pc which is more powerful already you have pcs more powerful than ps5 and right. then you could have like better games so um, I kind of agree with some of that, like, but I also kind of um, say like, yeah, but even if you have only PC, like, you will have to invest a lot of money in having the last PC that can, can move the last game. Like, people will still release games that can be played in, like, low NPCs sometimes. Like, Elden Ring is going to come and I think pretty much everyone is going to be able to play Elden Ring. <laughs> right. They need to make that money back. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and I'm not, uh, probably for Elden Ring it works, because Elden Ring probably is not going to be about the graphics. Of course, I, I'm sure it's going to look beautiful, but I think it's going to be more about the open world souls experience. It, it uh, but I actually yeah. um, talked to a friend kind of about that, like the difference between PC gaming and like gaming on a console. And it's almost like what we kind of alluded to with it, it's kind of like transcoding on Twitch, you know, where like, transcoding like if you stream at 1080p resolution and somebody can't watch it twitch will downscale it to like 240p so they can still watch it um and they twitch does that automatically i always feel like pc games are kind of like that where 
if you have the power to run it at 1080p or 4k or whatever like it you they'll have the option for that and then people that have lower spec pcs and don't have the power can still run it at lower resolutions lower frame rates lower textures but it's essentially like a much bigger breadth of where game developers can can put the assets in the game whereas when you design it for a console it's the console that says we need to have it at 30 frames a second and 1080p everything else is is open and it kind of they put those locks in place so they can't really expand too far beyond that and i kind of agree with what you're saying playing games like final fantasy 7 remake and the last of us part 2 i could just hear my jet engine of a playstation 4 just going trying to load everything and it's just crazy how much i don't know it's just crazy just how incredible these games can look on such old hardware i mean the ps4 came out in like what 2000 13 and and, and, so, yeah. and it can still play a game like the last of us part two like the optimization in that is just bonkers wild yeah like the fact that i think kudos to the developers because being able to do that in that game is just like wow it's like magic kind of and yeah i kind of get where friends coming from like it's i i've kind of thought of it with when it comes to seven i guess we're spending a lot of time talking about seven remake i, I didn't anticipate for this but we were big final <laughs> fantasy fans so it's all good we well, are yeah. um but yeah i know some people were really upset the yuffie dlc did not come to the ps4 but i really have felt it's kind of what we talked about earlier where it, it seems like the game was made for ps5 in mind and i don't know they kind of didn't want to downscale it to get to that ps4 level so i kind of get where they're going with that i kind of get where the friend is going like if you make a game that's just ps5 it can have better graphics it can focus more time on getting the textures and everything in there where if it's on ps4 and ps5 they have to make almost like two different versions of it you know um, um yeah it, it, uh, it, for pc it's basically the same like if you do like um uh, any game for pc then it will be like um like how much like P ps5 is like 60 frames per second now yeah yeah I, I, some of, some of them can even get up to 120 frames i think in yeah was it like devil may cry 5 there's 120 frame rate version not that i think my eye can see that anymore but <laughs> i i just got a uh, brand new monitors and they're all 144 hertz and and i mean i can like definitely tell the difference when playing like a fast paced game like apex legends or something i can definitely tell the difference between 60 frames and that 140 ish frames everything just feels it feels like it's it feels like it's sped up like you're pressing fast forward on the remote but it's not speeding up it's so weird so do you play apex um i've played it a little bit with some friends like off stream i haven't played it that much um i i don't i, I oh sorry there's like sorry fortune yeah i guess we somehow got spammed by Haas earlier i don't i don't know what was going on but maybe the bot ended up getting timed out i'm guessing might have be ha of what happened so it might just be a few more minutes but hosses have you have you encountered the Haas issue on twitch as well encounter Haas, yeah yes Haas is <laughs> so everywhere Haas visited me when actually it was carrying she's she she texted me let's say be careful like i was visiting by Haas like the different versions of Haas. And then as soon as I started my stream, I was followed by like 15 iterations of Haas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I was just starting. So I was just banning them because I didn't have, you know, like it was not busy at that moment. People were starting to come. Right. So, um, but yeah, I have been visited by Haas, which I cannot believe Twitch cannot do anything about that because it's been like, what, one month and a half, two months? Right. It's been a long time. Um, I mean, what if kind of just flipping right over from like games to the, the Twitch side of things specifically, like what do you think Twitch could do, should do to kind of combat a lot of this, uh, the hate raids, the hot spots? Like, what do you kind of, do you have any ideas or anything you've thought of anything you've heard any ideas um it's hard for me to say like ideas because you know i'm not like a developer or anything so right. I, I i'm assuming like it's hard to implement kind of it's things like what needs to happen on the... but i don't know how to do it kind of thing yeah but i'm sure like horse seems to be um all of them are hosts so i i'm sure that should be a pretty easy way to ban like massive host follows in channels or something like that like, because it's always the same kind of name 
this host or H zero S S or something right. like that. So right. I think something like that could be easily done. So, sounds like easy for me to do something like that. And I would. Twitch, I, I appreciate they are trying to like, you know, um, they are trying to accept as many people as possible in Twitch, you know, like they have the trans tag, they, the, the people were asking for a long time, but they eventually did it. So they are a bit late, but they are trying to like, you know, they also have like LGBT, gay, bisexual tags. So they are trying to do all those things, um, but um, you cannot, um, there is something some friend told me once, and I think you cannot be. You, you, they say people you have to be tolerant with everyone, but I don't think you can be tolerant with intolerant people. And when it comes to hate rates, is someone is going out of their way to create a kind of software or like kind of automatic rate to bother people in a platform just because they are black or because they are Asian or because they are like. LGBT plus members, like whatever. So it's a lot of effort into hate. So I would totally, that would be a like no, no for me. So like, I don't know how to do it. I, I cannot like, you know, I don't have the skills to say like, this should be done. But literally, um, I believe Twitch should do something about that because that's something coming out of their way to bother people just because who they are. And that's like, you cannot be tolerant with that. And you know, mm -hmm. Twitch is a private company, so they can actually implement whatever they want. They don't have they don't have to, you know, it's not from a governmental level. So they could just say like, no, look, no more hosts. <laughs> End of the story. No usernames hosts. <laughs> yes. I think they're like, we are sorry yeah. if you want to be host, but there is no more host. <laughs> I mean, I think if they banned the name host, they would just find like a different name to use essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yes. I know a big part of it is the fact that you can create multiple Twitch accounts with the same with one single email so you can just have like tons oh you can do that yes you can yeah that's a feature that's in settings for Twitch users for uh streamers there's a setting to where you can create multiple different Twitch accounts just stemmed off of one single email so that's probably a big way that the bots are doing this they're probably having software written that just creates all of these accounts from the single email and then once they get deleted or, or banned or whatever then they just go to another email so instead of them banning like one email with one account, it's they're banning like one email with thousands of accounts, essentially. Um, but yeah, if they got rid of that, I'm sure that would that would help or send, there wouldn't be as like massive hate raids or be like still there. I mean, there's always going to be hateful people. So they just like they always got to be on the mark for it. And, and Twitch is Twitch is interesting in the sense that it's not like YouTube where they can kind of like filter out the comments right when they get posted and there's like time for people to not be able to see it because they're not watching the video at that moment where with streaming it's so live it's so in the moment it's so like i mean especially sometimes for some of the bigger creators or stuff like this where we're not exactly paying attention to chat as much we could look down or like look over at chat and there's just all this hateful stuff being put in there and it's sometimes it just feels like that we don't have the tools we need to be able to do create the content and, and create the communities that we want to or, or protect the communities I should say um it just feels like we don't have the tools you know yeah um it feels I don't know from my point of view it feels sad because um I have had a couple of in, especially like since I, I never had like I had one I think bad interaction a long time ago but then it's since the gay tag started to be usable i started to use it and then since then i had um a couple of people like not bots like real people posting like uh, very negative comments and I, I don't mind because you know i'm over 30 years old i have my life solved like right. you know like i've been through that I, i've been like to my teens and i had like my like coming out of the closet and, you know, realizing who I was. So I'm, I'm sorted. So I don't mind that someone comes into my chat and say whatever they want. Like, I will just ban them and finish. Yeah. But I feel really sorry for like young, because there are many young con content creators in Twitch that actually they are probably very popular. And uh, they might have these kind of people coming and tell them those things. And it's just awful because maybe they don't have like the, like their mind is not prepared to handle this kind of situation. So defenses. Yeah, so I feel sorry for them and 
I don't know how Twitch can do that because what you say is, is live. It's not like YouTube because YouTube you might post a video and never see a hateful comment because it doesn't happen live. Yes, fair um, yeah, so I don't know how that can be. Um, the only way that it can be done is having a lot of mods in your channel, yeah. <laughs> which I'm sure we are thankful for our yes. mods. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of um, sad. I don't know. And a lot of education, people need to get educated in what is right and wrong, but yeah. So I would just send a message to people who get hateful comments. It's like, sometimes just, you know, don't think anything. Like sometimes it's like 10 years old kids that they don't even know what they are saying. Completely they agree. are repeating some hateful comments they have heard in the school or something. So just don't pay attention because they don't deserve the time to let you be worried. So yeah. I completely agree. Um, I've had some conversations with friends who, who've just been like, you know, when you get hateful comments or, or just very aggressive, just really just rude things, like how do you handle it? And, and it really just comes down to it. Like the, the harder you react to it, the more, the more of a, I don't want to say show, but the more of like, it looks like you're internalizing it and it's, and it's hurting you, the more joy the, the person is going to get out of it, unfortunately. Like, that's why people do these hateful raids and and say the nasty things they say and just, like, do these things. It's because they want to see somebody else on the other end get hurt and, and get, you know, take it to their heart. And it, it absolutely everything you said is so true. It, it's very sad. It's very, like, of everything you're going to do in your life, this is what really what you want to spend your time doing is is putting down others or annoying others or being hateful to others like you really get joy out of that that's very sad is definitely the word for it um but yeah i think just the, the best thing to do ban them move on they don't matter whatever they say they don't know you they don't know the real you they are not a friend of yours what they say has absolutely no bearing no weight on anything of you so i'm in the same boat as you like ban them move on they don't matter don't give them the time of day don't even react just okay ban Anyways, what were we talking about? Like kind of going like that. But yeah, some people just unfortunately don't have those defenses or have that kind of mindset in place. So sometimes they take a lot of that stuff to heart and they shouldn't. You absolutely should not. But just some people, it, it just gets through their defenses, unfortunately. Yeah. Or on the other hand, just create content. You can use this moment to say like a uh, very wholesome wholesome thing and then post it on twitch and then you use the hater for your own advantage <laughs> yes i've seen some people on twitter do that where like they'll get hateful rated and then they they block it kind of time them out and then they go full screen and just give a whole minute speech about how pathetic it is or sad it is and just kind of create a whole clip content segment out of it and it's it's amazing that's that's an a plus way to do it i don't know if i have that comedy on the ball kind of kind of can do it in the moment type of mentality but some people who can are just killing it yeah Absolutely. you have to be actually ready like um <laughs> like 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 you like if you get hate comments often i guess you are kind of ready for it so i guess you can like just go and do that kind of let it go yeah. i haven't been able to do it yet so <laughs> <laughs> um yeah honestly the, the biggest thing is really having mods like having mods um i know i'm kind of keeping tabs fortune we've gotten the hoss rated a couple times today or tonight it seems like um which is i haven't experienced this as much on the podcast usually when i'm doing the podcast i'm like 100 percent focused on the guest and not really keeping attention to chat but it's really interesting just or really frustrating just how these people kind of come out of nowhere and just hate raid and follow raid and so yeah big shout out to mods mods are seriously the the heart and soul of twitch of streamers like I would not be anywhere where I am. I don't think all of us streamers would be anywhere where we are without mods helping us, lifting us up, giving us that ability to be able to do that and not to have to constantly be sweating and, and watching. So huge shout out to the mods. They are they are the real MVPs for sure. They are, yes, yes. Thank you so much to all my mods too. Like, um, like they do a great job. Like um, some of them work um, when a sleeping time because of my streaming times <laughs> so thank you so much to to all of them yeah protecting me yes yes <laughs> absolutely it's it that it's truly the time they put in the, the effort they put in is i can't even put into words how appreciative i am i know all of us are so appreciative of them so just big shout out to them um kind of stemming 
full 180 off of this final fantasy gaming streaming <laughs> exactly exactly i'm ready um, usually so funny enough we're an hour into this conversation and usually the first question i ask is kind of getting to more about know more about you the streamer your history kind of the person behind the streamer so we i guess like now we're an hour in but we could still jump into that um what is what originally kind of i know you said you lived in i think spain earlier right like you originally lived in I was Spain. Born, yeah. Born in Spain, I was born in Spain. Lived in the UK a little bit, moved to Japan. What's kind of brought you over to Japan out of curiosity? I'm a nerd. So I, I enjoyed anime and uh, I was an anime anime boy. Uh, I enjoyed like Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, Sakura, Card Capture, um, anything really, um, Death Note. And Mm, I was very invested in, I wanted to live outside of Spain. So I went to the UK actually because I wanted to improve my English and like live abroad. And, but I was very interested in living somewhere that was not European, uh, like not Western, like not like, you know, the States or South America or like, um, like Australia. Like I wanted to live somewhere different, like, you know, it was basically Asia or Africa, I guess. Yeah. So. I was very interested in Japan because of all the anime and um, uh, I was watching. So, but I would have moved to China or to like Korea if I had the chance, but I first applied to, to come to Japan with a scholarship and I got it. So I came to Japan, yes. Uh, so the official reason is I came to study. The unofficial reason is I would have come probably either way. Yeah. <laughs> For a study or not. What's uh, like some of the biggest differences between living in Europe versus living in Japan out of curiosity? I'm sure there's so many, but like, what are some of the, if, if we were to like move over and fly over there and kind of be a tourist there, what would be the biggest shocks you think? Well, one shock from my students life that probably people would not see when they come to visit because they don't have the chance to see that is that uh, students can sleep in class. <laughs> can see like which i was i was actually shocked when i went to some of the lectures at university and students would just be on the table like this really? sleeping like like yeah like deeply sleep deeply asleep and um yeah it was the whole culture is different like in spain i feel like if you are sleeping in the classroom the teachers will kick you out or they will wake you up say like Oh, you were partying last night and then you have to be in class ready for, for the class. And but in Japan the teachers were like the professors were saying like, oh, they were probably working hard or they were studying hard, so they are sleepy, so Trusty. they can't sleep. So it was kind of very shocking for me to like what they are allowed to sleep? I was shocked about that. Like I think something that people normally don't say when um they uh, they've been asked what is the thing that is more weird when you come to Japan. But for me, it was like, wow, it's like a whole, per like the perception you have of something happening was completely different. For the professors here, it was like they were working hard. Right. But for the professors in, in Spain, it was like they were partying. Right, <laughs> so, right. So, which is probably true. Like Spain is famous for that. So, um, yeah. Uh, how clean it is. I think people say this all the time, but it's like, it's so clean outside like every toilet every public toilet is clean is there like a um, big um like big uh not passion but but just people are very passionate about keeping the streets clean picking up garbage just everyone together kind of has this like culture mentality of like we want to keep everything clean so just pick up garbage and just quickly throw it away is that kind of normal? so actually there is like um, one day of the year is the greenery day or something like that. Like, and, and groups of people go to the street to pick up um, rubbish. And for example, there is like the LGBTQ community that association in Kyoto. They have one day a year that they also go along the river picking up trash. So there are these kind of things um, that people do. Um, I always say this, like Japan is a very capitalistic country in the sense of consumerism like they, they love to consume everything <laughs> like there is all the colors all the like you know kit kat of 25 flavors um but then the, the their mentality is a little bit like socialism i guess like they really take care of everything that's public they know 
their limits as like, you know, like if you are using the bus, it's for everyone to use, not for themselves. So they keep it clean, uh, the streets. So I think they have like this kind of mentality that is like taking care of what is all, uh, everyone's. Our country. Yeah, like, yeah, so um, I think that that works for them in that sense of keeping everything clean and like being very respectful of each other, yes. Um, yeah, but it's surprising, like, especially coming from, from Spain or the UK, like, it's so clean here. Yeah. So, yes. Um, and and uh, now there's, let's say, a root thing. So, like, you know, a positive, and now a root thing that happens in Japan is like, they never stop in pedestrian crossings, the cars. Really? <laughs> they just never. <laughs> they just go. Like, uh, I mean, I must say, like, in Japan, it's really, they, they don't have, I don't know in the States, but in, in, in Europe, we have a lot of runabouts, but in Japan, they don't. So it's all traffic lights. And it's very rare to see a pedestrian crossing without a traffic light. So mm -hmm. I think they are not used to it, but there are some. And then if you are in a pedestrian crossing waiting to cross, you will never cross if yeah. there are cars coming, because they will never stop. <laughs> and that's very shocking because in Spain, it's completely the opposite. Like everyone stops in every pedestrian cross. And so it, it was like kind of, wow, Japanese people are so respectful, but they don't, don't, don't stop. They so come. interesting. <laughs> yeah, like in the States, it's it's there's a lot of, there's kind of, a, I'd say a bit of both, but mostly there's a lot of traffic lights. But yeah, when there's, uh, when the light's red, people don't drive through it. Like m people are usually really good about stopping, letting people walk not you know kind of looking both ways when they're not face planted in their phones you know when they're walking everywhere um but yeah that that that's that's really interesting i mean i know i've seen i've seen like drone shots and i've seen uh time lapses of downtown tokyo and just the the craziness the lights the people everywhere i've never i've been to new york and los angeles a couple times which are pretty big cities but like what is it like to just live in or just to to, to walk through probably the most populated dense or one of the most dense cities in the entire world like tokyo is tokyo is huge tokyo is massive it's like a whole huge it's i think it's the biggest city in the world technically or biggest metropolis um yeah i think it's one of the biggest and it's also like very um con like Condense. very dense i think because everyone goes to this city center like I, i'm lucky because i live in kyoto so yeah. i Kyoto is very like you know it's the old capital it's a lot of culture like you can go by bicycle everywhere it's quite flat um so i really enjoy living here because it has 1.7 million people so it's big enough to have everything you need but not so big as like tokyo yeah but every time i visit tokyo which i used to do before coronavirus visited us uh, <laughs> i used to go often <laughs> um the um, it feels like uh, people are really busy all the time. <laughs> yeah. Because the trains were like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure everyone has seen the, the people pushing people inside the trains and all those there. videos. Yes. I must say that that's real. Like uh, there are people who their job is, is that pushing people inside the train uh, in the mornings and they do that every day. Uh, oh, it man. is something like, you know, there are a lot of information coming from like oh look this is happening in japan and then it's not really true mm -hmm. like 90 percent of the time when you see a, something that looks weird in like some japanese people are doing something weird it's also weird for japanese people <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> like gotcha. it's, it's, it's something that is weird in japan as well it just happened to happen in japan but in the case of pushing people into the train is is a reality there are people who work doing that <laughs> I, I've so, always wanted to, I've yeah. always wanted to, I, I feel like everybody, but like, I feel like everyone wants to travel to Japan at least some point in their life. Uh, but I've always wanted to go to Northern Japan, like not even, you know, Tokyo. And uh, it would be amazing to, I feel like I would love to see Tokyo for sure. And, and the metropolis and downtown and everything, but it's always been like Northern Japan. That's always, I felt so, it's so beautiful and so tranquil and, and almost like a, completely different I, I don't know if it's maybe just from videos and and youtube videos and stuff that i've seen in documentaries but like it, it seems so much different than you know the big metropolis and big city life of of like tokyo you know um yeah in in some like it's a pity when japan is so exciting like it's so amazing place to visit like 
I feel bad when people just come and visit the main touristy spots, but at the same time, I totally understand because those spots are amazing themselves. Right. So, right. so it's difficult to to come to Japan and not go into like the main monuments right. because you want to see those. Um, but I would say like the countryside of Japan, if if people come here and they have chance to go, is is just amazing. The countryside is. So beautiful, so green, it's so different from the big cities and sometimes it's not so difficult. You don't need to go very far to go to the countryside. Sometimes you can just take like two hours train and you will be there. So or rent a car or something. So I 100% like my favorite place in Japan is called Yakushima and it's an island south of Kyushu. And it was an amazing trip. Like there is almost like it's very remote. And and then the animals are walking in the street so basically you can see deers monkeys just crossing the street like That's cool. it's like a, yeah it's really cool and there are people still people living there like you know there's a city and and things but it's like very uh ghibli movie-ish and yeah. I, I really like it um and have you played sekiro i have that's the only Soulsborne game i have not played yet so it's gonna be the last one a very so kind of, this, you, you, you see a lot of because because that's based in feudal japan i want to say right yeah i think i think if you want to have the sense of feudal japan i think uh, ghost of tsushima yeah. probably does a great job on that but sekiro is more like japan fantasy world right it's like a souls game based in japan so isn't it's like japan yeah. over the top which is really beautiful of course but there is a section um that actually you could miss because it's, it's not mandatory section but it's a basically no, i'm not gonna say spoilers but it, it's based on the autumn leaves in japan and how how it looks the like the maple the maple trees so it's just like one of the seats uh, one of the temples i visited in the north of japan that you said you wanted to go to the north and mm -hmm. um it looks exactly the same like walking the path to the temple looks like the Sekiro video game and I was like wow well, if someone plays this and they like it they need to come to Japan and see that part of Japan because it's breathtaking it's amazing one thing um that is is very as an American like here in the states there's not many there's not really like any old buildings or like old temples to really see there's stuff that's like a couple hundred years old you know some stuff that's like 400 years old on like the east coast and stuff but there isn't really like those temples or those monuments that are thousands of years old, you know, or like castles and stuff, you know, throughout the world or like pyramids or the Colosseums. Like there's not really any of that here in the United States as much. So yeah, it would be really cool to go and just be like, this was like 2000 years old and just to be able to experience it and, and the culture and the history of it. I haven't really experienced that. I've, I've never been outside of the United States and I, I especially feel bad because we live probably like six out maybe less than six hours like four hours from the canadian border and it's right there and i've never been so yeah there's a huge part of me that just wants to travel and see the whole world and i don't know i want to come to J japan is probably if i had a ticket to go anywhere in the world right now today it would japan would probably be like top three and would probably be the one i would pick so don't worry i have equipment to do li uh, life like live stream like real live stream yes. so we can go and have a walk <laughs> um live stream travel yeah, like, yes um yeah japan i i think i was i i was lucky enough to well, not only i live in, in kyoto but also i was working as a tour guide um before covid so i was lucky enough to visit all those places and um again and again and again and i never got tired of seeing them because they are so beautiful and i had to learn the history and like explaining and it's just so nice like if you have chance to like read a little bit or like like understand like of course like i know how easy it is when you i've been traveling in places and not understanding what i'm seeing but if you have like 30 minutes to read about a place you are going and the history behind it is so much better when you come to japan because you get to understand what's going on how it was built and why and i don't know the castle in kyoto is one of my favorite places and it's all because of the history of the shogun like fighting each other it's, it's really exciting um it feels like being in a like anime or like yes in like yeah. old style video game when you go to those places yeah it's very well like preserved so yeah everyone comes to japan but it's really nice yeah <laughs> uh, i know you mentioned they're kind of like ghibli movies i i 
don't know very much about anime at all. I'm very, I don't know much at all. I know like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh growing up. I was, I loved watching those. I was really big into them. And, but I, I haven't really dove into any anime since then, um, except for I have watched Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke. And both of them are incredibly gorgeous. They, they almost feel like an anime version of like a Pixar movie where, where it's like has those kid elements, but also has a lot of adult themes kind of hidden in there. And it's, it's very, I really, really liked them a lot. Um, and, and I want to dive in more and watch more of the Studio Ghibli movies. Um, what do you think is the best one that you'd recommend out of curiosity? I know that's hard. Well, to I have answer. to, <laughs> it's hard, it's hard, but I, I have to, I have, I have an answer because I've been asked you, when you live in Japan, people ask you that all the time. So, <laughs> uh, I have an answer that is not the, everyone's, everyone almost say, uh, either Princess Mononoke or Totoro or um, uh, Spirit Away. I think those are the three movies that everyone says, but for me, I don't know, Nausicaa. I don't know if you have heard of that, Nausicaa. Yeah, yeah. It just clicked with me so much, like the theme, it was very adult theme, like, um, it, it's, it's about a girl, like, making friends with bugs, basically. <laughs> It doesn't sound very exciting, but there is a very big message in the movie. Um, I, I don't know. I really, really enjoyed that movie a lot. Um, it's one of the old movies. I don't know, like night, early 90s or maybe 80s. Like, uh, yeah, so um, it's, I really like that one. Yeah, and I, for everyone who comes to Japan and they want to go to the Ghibli Museum, you have to book the ticket three months in advance because it gets fully booked. Wow. So they, they, they come out three months. They, so for example, if you want to go on middle of December, the tickets will be starting to be sold in middle of what? Three months earlier. Oh, that's September. Is that? So <laughs> you have to, they, I mean, one week, probably they are gone. So wow. if anyone wants to go to the Ghibli Museum, which is highly recommended book in advance. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. Um, but cool. yeah, I haven't watched all the Ghibli movies, surprisingly, even though I live in Japan. I think I missed like three or four, so mm. I still need to watch those. I haven't, it's called Porco Rosso, I think. I haven't watched that one. The yeah. the pig one, right? Yes, I haven't watched that one yet. Yeah. And uh, when I came to Japan, I, started, I, I watched a few that I haven't watched before coming to Japan, yes. But right now, I actually don't watch so much anime. Like, um, because it's difficult to find anime, the good anime themes that are adult now. Like mm -hmm. when I was a kid, it was very easy because many of the anime were like more like, Keep you know, focused. a plot holes. You don't care about plot holes when you are 10 years right. old, right? right. So. <laughs> Have you noticed um, that like as you've gotten older, I was talking to my wife about this a few days ago, actually, like it's really cool going back and watching movies that I loved watching when I was a kid. And you almost like experience the same movie in a completely different mindset and you just pick up on so many different themes and before maybe it was just like you love the characters and you love the story and that was it but yeah as an adult you find plot holes or maybe you're like i wonder how they recorded that or directed that i wonder why they decided to go this way with the characters like there's so many other parts of your brain that are asking questions versus just being absorbed in the story and it's it's almost like you can experience and the same thing with video games like playing video games i grew up with and playing them again i'm like I, there were so many things i didn't even notice yeah uh 100 like um i i now i don't know if it's something that's happening now but in japan i notice how many movies and how many like animes are based on high school students Yes. Like, yes. I don't resonate with that so much anymore because uh, obviously I'm not a high school student, even if I look like, but um, uh, yeah, it's like, <laughs> um, it's hard to find, like, I like, I read a lot of fantasy as well, like fantasy books, and it's hard to find fantasy books that the characters are not 14 or 15 years old, like mm -hmm. even Game of Thrones. I'm so, I'm so glad, like Game of Thrones, they decided to like very they, aggressive they, they, and mature yeah like they they actually like the actors are older like like i think daenerys targaryen is supposed to be 14 years old in the books mm. when she started her story but in the in the show i think she's like 18 or something like that right. so i i'm thankful they changed that <laughs> because it's kind of hard story what she goes through uh, like all the characters so i i in fantasy this happened to me a lot like i it's hard to like enjoy things that are not adult themed or like the main characters there are not many adult main characters like when i played final fantasy 10 i think my favorite character was um tidus 
it's called Tidus mm -hmm. in, in English. Yeah, I, yeah. I played in Spanish, so. <laughs> um, but now I would love Oro much more. Right. I think he's way cooler, but I think it's because of the state of life. I feel like that's, like I, when I was playing the game, I thought like he was like, oh, he's a little bit annoying. But now <laughs> I feel like he's actually pretty cool. Right. So I think that changed our perspective of what characters we like or like, yeah, like, what kind of story they are telling or the meaning behind the story because what you say happened to me with x-files like i re i watched x-files like when i was an adult and i watched x-files when i was a kid that i shouldn't have maybe but anyway <laughs> um when i was a kid it was really scary like it was like really like oh what's gonna happen like i was very in involved in the story but um as an adult it was almost funny like it was like kind of oh wow this is actually kind of uh what's happening now is com almost like com comedic like yeah. funny so yeah it's, it was very different perspective to see both as a kid and as an adult i think that it can kind of if you can watch a movie as a kid and really love and appreciate it and then watch it again as an adult and find different things from it and still love it i think that's just such a, a solidifying statement of just how good and mature a movie is and i think uh like pixar movies do a great job with with so many of their titles like watching stuff like toy story or you know finding nemo or just up watching all these movies as an adult there's still so many things that can tug at your heartstrings or make you think or there's almost like these very philosophical big universe questions kind of buried in a, a fun kid fantasy kind of way but you know as an adult you watch it and you're like oh that makes that kind of makes me does do wonder a little bit kind of think a little bit harder so yeah i think those are just testaments of just great 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 characters and great movies for sure i went to the cinema to watch toys i think it was toy story 3 the one that was mm -hmm. uh released way after the toy story 2 and yeah. um, i watched toy story 2 and one as a kid and you know, it was a hard job to make a movie for an audience. Like probably they were tra targeting kids, but also the the kids of Toy Story one and two that now are adults. Right. And I think it was such a great movie, Toy Story three. Like I enjoyed, and I could not even. I, I was like, kids watching this probably they enjoyed a lot too. So it was just amazing. Like I watched Moana also like in the cinema, yes. and I really enjoyed it. So I think this movie that kids and adults can enjoy together. Is uh, they are amazing. I'm talking about G in the case of, um, like in the case of Disney or Pixar. I think the the music, the quality, the story is really well done. In the case of Ghibli, I think there is this kind of deeper fantasy aspect that when you are a kid you don't comprehend, but you still enjoy the movie. But when you are an adult, you are like, crap, this is deep deep stuff happening here like uh, right. with princess mononoke like Naushika, like i felt like that i was like this is kind of transcending like like what uh, animation is so yeah i think what you said totally recommend it if you enjoy something as a kid rewatch it um and probably you will enjoy it in a different way the only thing with that is just be prepared to rewatch it as an adult and maybe it's terrible and you just have to come to grips yeah. with that. So you're diving in and it could be amazing, it could be bad. So just beware. <laughs> yeah, like be, be ready to be disappointed too. It right. could happen. Yeah. Um, my wife and I, we just watched the Matrix trilogy uh, a few a few weeks ago and watching that as a kid, I loved the first Matrix because of all the action and, and everything in it. And watching it as an adult, there were so many things I didn't even pick up on, on like the whole simulation theory, the idea of like being, are we like in a, a computer kind of idea in like a video game and like the red pill versus blue pill whole philosophy there's so many different things like i didn't even really pick up on that yeah just kind of diving back into it it really shows how good of the quality it is so yeah i definitely if there's games or books or just any media that can give you an escapist realm to dive into it's worth revisiting it maybe not even just as a kid and adult but maybe when you're 50 reread it again or rewatch it again maybe when you're like 70 reread it and watch it again and it's always going to be the same thing but because you are like this overarching changing of different philosophies and mindsets and where you're at in your life, you're always going to get like different messages out of it. Yes, 100%. It's what, what we were talking before about like um, the, the being an adult, like what you take home is completely different, like right. being a kid. So, yes. Um, now I'm reading, um, I don't know if you have heard The Wheel of Time. 
I don't know if I have heard of that. Because it's coming to uh, Amazon Prime, I think. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's starting in next month. It's a new fantasy show. And it's one of the most um, famous fantasy sagas. I think there are 15 books. Oh, wow. So I'm in for a ride. Yes, <laughs> it's a long saga. But it's, it's very well regarded in the fantasy like world. Um, I'm reading the first book because the first um, season is coming to, to Amazon Prime and I want to like read before watching it. So for everyone out there who is uh, who doesn't have anything to read and you enjoy fantasy books, um, The Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time. I will look into that yes. for sure. I, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot so far. And is it like more adult fantasy, kind of like Game of Thrones-ish, would you say? So it's, I would say like, and people actually criticize the first book because of this. Um, the, apparently the other books go in like completely different ways, but it's a little bit um, Lord of the Ring-ish. Oh. So the story is, the story at the beginning is kind of similar, like young people taken away from their town, like, you know, the hobbits are taken away because of the ring, but in this case, different reasons. But yeah, like, it's kind of like that there is a powerful uh, mage, like, um, how, what was the name? Um, <laughs> so yeah, like um, it's, it's kind of similar to it's Lord of the Ring ish, but I would say it's a little bit more serious or a little bit more goofy sometimes. I, I would say um, so it's fun. That said, I haven't read a lot of the Rings. I just I'm I'm, I'm based on what I saw in the movies, so yeah. I'm, I'm comparing with that. But yes, uh, it's it's really fun. Although it's long. 15 books is a lot. That's a commitment. <laughs> That's almost as good as, as Fortune uh, keeps recommending me to watch One Piece. It's like an anime TV series. And uh, yeah, yeah there's, she said there's like a thousand episodes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's a commitment yeah. in and of itself right i told her i'm like that's like that's not watching a series that's like a relationship <laughs> you like marry that so i think a fortune that the fortune recommended you that to watch one piece yes okay uh i, I might um fortunately is she's watching but i must say don't don't do it <laughs> don't do it is it too much no, like the thing is, like it's what we were talking. For me, One Piece is not so adult theme anymore. Oh. So that said, I'm reading it because it's really good to learn Japanese. Like you know, like um, when I came to Japan, I started reading manga, and then I started to read um, Death Note, and then also I started to read um, Attack on Titan, and it was impossible yeah. because the level is so high. Like the, the plot is difficult to understand in English, let alone Japanese. But One Piece is amazing for me to read in because it's really fun, you know, it's, it's like for kids too. So it's really fun and it's not difficult because the language is also like for kids and I learn a lot. So I'm reading it. So, um, of course, by all means, watch it if you want. Uh, don't watch the like the um, there are some feeling episodes. You don't need to watch those. Um, the story is very good up to the middle of the story. Like um, right now, it's still not finished. It's very long. Yeah, it's basically very long. If I recommend you an anime, it would be Death Note. I have watched, um, I watched a little bit of Death Note. I think like the first 10 or 11 episodes of it. I was intrigued with it. Something was going on where we ended up like not watching TV for a long time after that. But yes, I do want to finish Death Note. We did watch a little bit of that. And then um, Cowboy Bebop is another one everyone says I should watch. Yeah, I, my friends keep on recommending me that one. I haven't yet, but they, they keep on saying that one. For that note, you don't need to finish it. Like there are two endings. Like there is one ending and then the story continues a little bit later. You don't need to see the second part. <laughs> Just the Only part. to the first ending. <laughs> yeah, everyone says, I haven't, I haven't watched the second part, but everyone says it's not worth it. So I stopped. Mm. Yeah. The first ending was a, a big closure for me. So it was good enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I... I yeah I did grow up a little bit watching like I mean I loved Pokemon growing up Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh were like man I would watch actually me and my wife just randomly started watching Yu-Gi-Oh a few years back again and it was yeah watching it with adult eyes there was a lot of things I noticed about it especially when they would go to like a, a commercial break and then when they'd come back they'd have like a whole one minute of just refreshing the last like eight minutes that you watched and you're like skip 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 can we get to where we're going and then yeah there, there was a lot of like filler moments it seemed and and it was really cool to watch it again as an adult though and pick up on those things so 
yeah i'm i'm intrigued yeah. i want to watch death note i want to watch the ghibli movies definitely I, I feel like i've been saying it on stream for months like i, I want to watch them i was thinking about doing like a discord party watching them like oh, once yeah, a month or yeah. something and just kind of go through all of them starting at the beginning and kind of going through but yes studio ghibli it's yeah, well, gotta watch it one of the streamers i i i was gonna say we watch actually i mod <laughs> He did, uh, he did, he watched all the Lord of the Rings. They were talking about the Lord of the Rings in the stream for a long yeah. time. And then he suddenly said, oh, let's do like the three movies. And they watched the three movies in, in this course. So I think that's a great idea. I like yeah. that. I was actually thinking to, to do that with, uh, because I watch RuPaul Drag Race. Mm -hmm. and I really like it. But then no one who comes to my stream, I think, watch Ru RuPaul Drag Race because every time I comment, no one responds. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to be watching alone. So I watch with my partner, actually. So... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I feel like, but yeah, I was thinking you, you could always like just share it in Discord and like you watch it, and then just if somebody wants to hop in and watch it, they could, you know. Yeah, I, with the I woke up randomly and I saw like the PS uh, PS Now, which was the last one PlayStation, the last announcement PlayStation did. Mm -hmm. And I woke up, I didn't know there was an announcement, the one that they show a little bit of God of War. Oh, yeah, yeah, like Venom. So I just woke up and I was like, oh. I didn't know this was happening, so I just randomly say in this for like, I'm gonna watch for now, anyone who can join, and then two people join, so um, it was fun. So yeah, and that, that's the beauty of Discord, actually, at the beginning I didn't know if create it, should I create a Discord, but it's cool because, you know, you might say like, oh, I'm gonna just stream something, or like, we just watch something with people, so it's kind of nice. I, I've definitely learned that with streaming, like, it's almost like there are a lot of viewers and streamers who kind of I don't know if cross pollinates the word. They just kind of like overlap each other on other people's streams. But when you get all of those people in one single channel, like at, at least with mine, since I stream the same time every day, like, or, you know, Monday through Friday, there's always those people there at the exact same time and point. So there really is like this community that each streamer has of like their chunks of viewers and chunks of streamers and the mods and the whole thing is like in that one moment and discord's a great way for you to bring all of that after the stream or before the stream beforehand and to and to share in things like yeah like watching movies or just talking offline it's a i think i think every streamer should at least have it how active you have to be in it i'd say is definitely up to the streamer themselves some people are like I'm usually a little bit more active on Twitter than I am on my Discord, but some people like just live in Discord. Like that's their go for everything. So, but I think it is a great tool for not even just streamers, but just creators in general and people who want to bring their audience to get closer to them, you know? Yeah, like let's be honest here. My Discord is dead, but you know, I say that in a good sense. Like it's not like it's like, I just like, I'm chill, so I use like Twitter too, and I, I'm very active on like streaming. Like I, I think I put 100 of my energy into like streaming, uh, and then I have a full time work, so right. things moving around. So it's difficult to to deal with like 20 social <laughs> platforms. But I like my Discord because of this. It's a chill, I don't put pressure on myself. Like I have to be active in the discord but i know that people are receptive like when i post something people react like people comment so you know and maybe it's not like super active but it's like good enough and the people who need to get information from there they will get it so that's good and um, yeah like um for me it's like you I'm, I'm a little bit more active in twitter uh but yeah like twitching would be like 100 percent like where i put most of the effort right now yeah, yeah. versus yeah. like youtube or like uh, tweet twitter or like discord i did see the, um i did check your youtube a little bit before kind of like took some notes on it um what originally kind of got you interested in starting youtube i saw you had over a thousand subscribers on there did you post content beforehand or what, what's the whole story with your youtube out of curiosity so yeah, I had like the 1,000 from when I was doing, I had a lot of, they are hidden. They are still there. I could make them public at any point. But I have like 50 videos, I think, of me traveling in Japan. Like, um, like vlogs? Like doing things. It was actually, it was like, a, I did some videos on uh, talking about Japanese topics at home. Like, just like video vlog. Like, and then others, like just traveling with my bicycle, like uh, going to Okinawa, going to different, I traveled a lot when I came to Japan at the beginning. So. There were a lot of videos of those. Some of them were really popular because I 
I was living in a very countryside place before called Tokushima and there were no videos about those places because people didn't go there. <laughs> so some of them were actually popular. But then since I I stopped that when I started the PhD because I got really busy and then eventually I started Twitch and I decided to like, you know, reuse the YouTube channel. I decided to make them unpublic because I thought it wasn't it was very confusing to have both with the Twitch content. Thing. Yeah, so uh, they're still there though. So now I, this is the thing, like what I really wanted, like the first person probably I saw streaming was you and Porto and it was Final Fantasy and it's because I wanted to, I just played Final Fantasy VII Remake and I needed to talk to people on the game. So that's why I started streaming. But what I really wanted to do was a podcast. That, that was my, my, and I wanted to do it. I always had this, creative mind of having a podcast because I wanted to do it about nutrition, which is like I studied nutrition back in. now I'm like molecular biologist I would say, but my background is like food science and nutrition. So I wanted to have a podcast about nutrition or like a podcast about like I had like many topics I, I wanted to do a podcast about and then I said like maybe I should do a podcast about gaming and about like because I love it's like really like my passion. I love games a lot. So but it was Game complicated. Grinders, right? Yes, yes, game grinders, yes. So that's the, it was complicated because I didn't know anyone. I, I felt like, should I do a podcast by myself? And it was the, the perfect versus the good thing where I was like, oh, what should I do? So I started streaming is, instead. So I said like, oh, you know, I'm going to start streaming and then I can talk to people about games. It's either be like the podcast scene and maybe I can meet people and create the podcast. Um, then eventually I decided like, oh, instead of having one person to do the podcast, I'm just going to, talk about games with different people that play those games. That, so I did the episode on The Last of Us Part 2. I did the episode on Final Fantasy VII Remake that it was so long. We were talking about like six hours, I think. Yeah. But I had to do like different episodes. It's like the game. It has different chapters. Right, right. <laughs> and I liked how you had chapters in there for like, we're talking about like the wall market scene or we're talking about Tifa or we're talking. I, I liked how you broke it up. That was really cool. Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed all the conversation uh, with it was with friends, so it was very nice. And yeah, I'm still actually editing the last part of that one, and I would like to go back to it at some point. Like it's been like stop because I focus more on on the stream on Twitch. And but now that I moved to the new place, I'm hoping to have like more of a routine life. Like I got a new job, my life has changed 360 degrees. I'm finishing the PhD while I found a new job, while I moved house. So it was all like, um, I managed to keep on streaming. So it was a lot, it was a lot. Um, was streaming but kind I of your, like it, the thing that grounded you through it? You could like always look yes. forward to streaming. And actually it was kind of, I always make this joke in my stream, like Arif, Arif Johan knows. <laughs> I always say like, this is like my intervention, it's my therapy, because you know, being a PhD student is hard. So I had a lot of mental stress. So I like, actually looked, looked forward to streaming, hang out with people. It was like a disconnecting from like, what was happening outside. So An um, yeah, I, yes. But now like my life is, I would say it's improving a lot. Uh, it's getting to a better place. I'm hoping to like having more time to focus also on um, youtube videos but i would like to i'm thinking to actually spend time learning how to edit and like you know like maybe do a little course about how to edit videos and everything because that's gonna save me long more time in the long run because i spend way too long time editing the videos yeah. like the videos i have now it took me like double time than recording just editing them so uh, i want to be faster in that it's kind of what we talked about at the beginning, like that perfectionism, you know, 80% is good enough. Just kind of, cause I'm in the same boat. Like I, there's a lot of ideas I have some videos, like I've even recorded for YouTube. Um, and I just like, haven't posted cause I'm like, so perfectionist about them and I want things different and I'm listening back and I'm like, Oh, this sounds terrible. I'm just going to erase all of it. We'll try again. So I, I that's the one thing for myself that I just haven't I follow that 80% rule in like so many other aspects of my life, but with YouTube posting original content on there, that's the one thing I do struggle with, but I, I want to overcome it and I want to just, yeah, you don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. The most important thing is like you at least get started, you put something out there and then you grow from it, right? Yes, like, um, but 
let's try not to be too harsh on us too like i think like having this perfectionism or like this trying to it's because you really care about it so yeah. i think it's good to try to put a good product or like a like a good like video out um so i think that's that's good it's just it, it's better to be released than hidden right, <laughs> in right. this case because <laughs> like at the end of the day it's, it's, it's content and you know a bad video is not gonna bring you down as much as not releasing any video so True. i yeah so i guess like we we need to like, keep on focusing on do good quality like uh, content but also like try not to be too harsh on us like this needs to be perfect exactly yeah. i completely agree um one question i really did want to ask we kind of touched on it a little bit but what has been your favorite game so far that you've streamed on Twitch, out of curiosity? Well, um, it has to be Final Fantasy VIII Speedruns, um, because yeah. that's, uh, that's been a game within a game. Um, like, you know, I, it was Final Fantasy, like, I never, like, there What's is this, the story you know, behind and, that? Like, how did that all get the started? The story behind that is, it has a name of a person, and it's Sign I Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know her. She's awesome. <laughs> so she's she's awesome. Um basically I was normally I work so my my routine was PhD Monday to Sat Monday to Friday and Saturdays I work in a school, which I'm still working. But it's not every Saturday. So that Saturday I happened to don't have to go to school, so I was free. I woke up and then I was like uh, I'm gonna clean the house and I'm gonna chill with Twitch on the background. And I wanted to listen to Final Fantasy VIII music, so I said, I'm gonna see a Final Fantasy VIII um, stream. And then Sarah Shui was streaming. Um, I went to her stream and she was speed running. I had no idea what speed running was. Like in general, like I saw speed running, but I thought that only happened for Mario games or something like that. Right. right. <laughs> like I didn't comprehend a Final Fantasy game being speed run. And then uh, I, she was just starting, it was like my 11, because we are in similar time zones, because she's in Australia, so it was uh, my a, a 9 or 10 a.m., and she was starting, and then she kept on going, it was at 9 hours speed run, and I was like, what is happening here, like, Jeez. she's never gonna finish this? And she finished the game eventually, and I was very hyped, and then I, I also love her, like, personality, like, I, I really connected with who she is and her way of streaming. So I I hung out in her stream for a long time. Not for a long time, like maybe a couple of weeks. And then I just said, I'm thinking to speed run in Final Fantasy VIII too because it looks really fun. And then she just said like, oh, this Sunday you're gonna do it. <laughs> you're like, going to do it, like, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she, and she got me, like she and uh, Bert, like uh, her mod, they both came into my stream and they, basically stay with me from the beginning to the end of the speed run, oh, like goodness. telling me what to do yes that's like, amazing like I, my first speed run was 12 hours everyone mm -hmm. like the first one so um it was a long stream it was 11 i think so yeah they helped me a lot uh, and it was really fun and since then i did i don't know maybe i did like 15 or 20 speed runs so oh my camera is not yep, focusing yep, yep. <laughs> Now? There it is, yes. there it is, okay. Sorry. It, okay. Does, it does that sometimes, sorry. Oh, you're good, you're good. And I paid a lot for that camera. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it, out of curiosity? It's a um, uh, Razer Kiyo Pro. Ooh, okay, okay. Yes, do you know the Razer Kiyo that has the light? I do, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's a great version of that one. Uh, oh, gotcha. It's really good, I really like it, but it has this focusing problem that sometimes doesn't focus. <laughs> Interesting, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So um, there is that, but yeah, it's good. Uh, but yeah, like, and then I've been speed running for a long time. Now I took a break to do all the Dark Souls games. So I'm doing one, two, three, but uh, after I finish three, I plan to do like another month of speed running Final Fantasy VIII. And I'm just loving it because I love the community super supporting. Like uh, there are a lot of people speed running. There are people um, like finding new paths to make it shorter. It's kind of really active and interesting. So yes, I love, uh, Final Fantasy VIII. I have to say it's my favorite game I stream, probably. Yeah. Do you have any plans for speedrunning any other Final Fantasies or any other games? Because, like, I almost feel like there's a difference between speedrunning a game that's 30 minutes to an hour versus, like, a nine-hour behemoth of a game 
you know it's it's almost uh i don't know if I'd, i i thought i've thought about speed running before but i don't know if i could ever do a final fantasy game i'd probably be more in like the ocarina of time in 50 minutes or something kind of thing you know um uh, well there is the final fantasy 7 uh which is my favorite game too it's like you it's like my all-time favorite game it's actually so broken like there are so many glitches that you can actually finish in like three hours so it's not that long uh, compared with Final Fantasy VIII, that is eight hours. Final Fantasy VII is three hours. So I thought of uh, speedrunning that one, but I don't know. I'm not sure yet. I actually want, it takes very long time to speedrun, like not speedrunning. I mean, long time to learn, learn how to how speedrun. To. Yes, practice, learning all the menus, everything. So my goal is being like top five of Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah. And then when I reach there, yeah, when I reach there, I might think of speedrunning speed something else. Like now, Sina Shuga is starting to speedrun Final Fantasy, uh, no, sorry, uh, Resident Evil 2, the remake. And she said, like, there are, in her community, there are other people uh, speedrunning other Resident Evil games. Yeah. And then she said, like, there is no one speedrunning five. And then she said, I have to do that one. And I was like, but wait, 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 because I haven't even played the game, like, right. like first place, yes. It's like, this is what <laughs> oh, you gotta I'm do. <laughs> so, actually, that's something I want to do. Um, I want to play all the Resident Evil games, because I only play one and two. So, I want to play three to eight at some point. That would be, yeah, I've heard a lot of people love the Resident Evil games. I've never really played them myself, but, yeah, Resident Evil and Silent Hill, people love those games. Yeah, and their speed runs are shorter, so yeah. that's good. That is that yeah. eight hours. <laughs> I've seen some people do Breath of the Wild 100% speed runs where they get all the Korok seeds, they get the shrines, everything. And sometimes those are like 20 hour long streams. I have no idea how people, because I mean, it, it's not like it's 20 hours at their best time. So you know they've had to have spent probably double that just to learn it, if not even more than that. More, more, oh, yes. Yeah. I think more. And I'm practicing and yeah, like it, it, it's crazy. The Final Fantasy VIII 100% speedrun is I think 11 or 12 hours. So it's already like a lot, but yeah. Breath of the Wild 20 hours. And take into account you need to be focused. It's not like right. something like, like, I mean, you have in Final Fantasy VIII, you have resting times where it's only dialogue. So you just have to mash X and square as fast as you can. So you don't need to really, you can chat actually. You can keep keep track of the chat. I where you uh, also. I saw um, a clip of yours with Final Fantasy VIII where I think they're in the spacecraft, Renoa and Squall. And I think somebody was saying something about it was like a throw, like the faces or something looked terrible. It was one of your most popular clips. And yeah, I noticed during that, it kind of seemed like more of a downtime. Sorry to jump in right there. No, yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, like, but like, um, there are other times that you need to focus a lot. When you are doing the menus, you need to be as fast as possible. So I mean, I'm thinking like the Zelda 20 hours there yeah. must be many times where you are doing like the the shrines or some fights that you need to focus a lot so right. that sounds like sounds pretty difficult yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I, I could not imagine focusing I saw one person who did I think Demon Souls all three of the Dark Souls games and Bloodborne no hit runs through all of them and that would just be insane the amount of focus like speedrunners and like deathless and no hit run people have is just it really is like a game within a game right yes it is so the person i was saying before that watched the lord of the rings in his uh he's an odd hit no hit runner yeah. uh of, of dark souls uh, aim run mm -hmm. and um he did the um, he just got last like three days ago he got trilogy dark souls one two three no hit after like three months of trying yeah like i don't know how they can do that that's crazy <laughs> and um yeah like and speaking of that i wanted to ask you something like have you ever been in a stream and seen someone and be like wait a second what are you doing here like a uh, kind of moment because that happened in aim run stream like uh, you know dahlia right yeah so i met dahlia through your raid i think i think the first okay. time i saw her i think yeah, yeah it was yeah, and um, then like three or four months later, Dahlia was hanging out at Aim Run stream, like doing no hit run of, of Dark Souls. And I was like, Dahlia, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, it, and it happened to me so many times in some people's streams that it's kind of, kind of funny how Twitch works in, in that sense. 
because it was like you know i have this community of people doing a lot of rpgs like we enjoy this these games but i have like also like aim run and i know like 10 or 15 streamers that do uh, no hit runs of yeah. dark souls so i was like how is dahlia involved <laughs> i really feel like twitch is just like one like so many of the communities overlap each other and it really is such a huge world and such a small world at the same time especially these almost niche communities of particular genres i think it'd be more it's maybe not as common if you see somebody who is like a big dark souls soulsborne player and then they maybe become like really good friends with like a call of duty player that might be a little bit rarer but yeah like people who are in just like the rpg community or the soulsborne community or the you know minecraft community everybody kind of like starts to see each other especially if you do it if you stream for a year or two years like a long time you really do kind of start seeing everybody within it and everybody's really supportive and for the most part everybody's yeah. usually really kind with each other yes that's the best part like when people are supportive like the final fantasy 8 speedrun community was really support like you know you are competing against each other mm -hmm. so you're fun but way. at the same time it, everyone was helping each other and i think the no hit run community is the same and, yeah. and at the end of the day it's, it's the same for twitch because we are all like kind of competing uh you know like some stream, yeah stream at the same time or whatever but i think at the same time we are helping each other and that's right. how we grow by helping each other so i think i like a lot that kind of vibe and, and community we create it almost feels like there's like competition to push each other away and then there's competition to like unite and bring people together and i've definitely seen some streamers who don't want to collaborate don't want to raid like don't they're not interested in in helping their friends grow they just like want to focus on themselves and then i've never liked that approach i just think the whole the cliche if if you will philosophy of the rising tide lifts all boats scenario so i just want to help everybody who needs help or asks for help or wants help or like if i ever have questions i know reaching out to people there's so many people i can talk to so yeah, i think just being there for each other and just always trying to support your fellow streamers your fellow content creators it goes such a long way truly yes 100 percent agree and um and it comes for at least for me it comes back to me because i really think that human relations are like the way of happiness like like the way to be happy so you know like if i'm streaming and then i rate someone and i know it makes them happy it makes me happy too so it is selfishly is also a way to make me happier to like collaborate and, and do things together with other streamers so share yeah. the love right yes yes totally always share. Um, <laughs> speaking of amazing content august i gotta ask when can we expect another tifa cosplay in the near future well it's it's, it's not a cosplay it's <laughs> tifa it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a different entity um well tifa has been here and she has left the boots Ooh, the so boots. she needs to come and pick them up so <laughs> What about an Aerith cosplay? I think we can, we can expect Tifa to be back soon. Soon? I would say like within a month, maybe. Oh, very soon, possibly. Yes, possibly. Yeah. Would you ever consider Aerith, I don't know if she will show up here, Aerith. Poor Carrion. She's, we might have... she's waiting for Aerith, probably. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Aerith should visit Carrion <laughs> instead of here. Yeah. Carrion, Aerith cosplay. I think that needs to happen yes that needs to happen yes yeah like i i really enjoy like the, the the cosplay was was a present like it was funded by donations of the viewers so i really enjoy uh embodying the new version of tifa i loved it and i, lo I loved your like when I, I saw some of the clips of it and you just were like so spunky and fun with it i love that you you totally rocked it like a champion thank you thank you yeah it was really fun it was really fun and people were vibing too so yes you gotta you just gotta have i feel like sometimes people just don't have a sense of humor on the internet and some people are are so serious about just everything and and i love hanging out with friends and people who can just like laugh at themselves or love themselves and just have a good time and and like i i feel like with myself i will always be the first to laugh at myself i don't take myself seriously at all i take myself as a content creator and a streamer seriously but like me the person 
I'll laugh at myself every day of the week and just have fun with it because I feel like life is too short to not have a good time and, and to take everything so seriously, you know? I I agree totally. And I think also like for me, like make fun of myself is a way of opening the door of making fun of other people. Like not in a bad sense, like, you know, by joking with chat or like right. saying like, like I have a very good rapport with, I don't know, with Ari for Carrie and like they are my mods. So I get to joke and like bully them a little bit in in, yes. in, in a funny way. But I, I bully myself a little bit first and then I get to like, you know, share and then like make jokes together. So it's a way to like break the ice when it comes to jokes. Like if you start joking about yourself, you can, you are kind of allowed to, and also you allow chat to be more relaxed and joke about things with right. you too. So I, I feel like not taking yourself too seriously is good. And, and I want to give you kudos for what you said because you do take yourself serious about like your content creation. You take it yourself very seriously. And I have that feeling from the very first moment, like I was watching you and, and I think that's something that should be appreciated by everyone who sees you and should see the effort you put into it because it it translates. I, I can see it every time, like how your stream has grown and I don't mean viewership, I mean like quality wise, as I think it's, it's amazing. So like very good job, I think, like kudos to you. I really, really appreciate it. I, I feel like that's one of the best parts about the journey, you know, is, is always making improvements and always just trying to try new things and some things you'll try and they won't work out and they'll be kind of a failure and then other things you'll try and they'll be super successful so but if you're never trying new things and and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone then it's just kind of it gets life gets boring and life gets stagnant and just kind of getting out of your comfort zone and just trying new things in the world seems like that's a good idea try to live by that it for is. sure um yes i know we're both playing through the Soulsborne series right now we were talking a little bit about it previously one question i would love to ask though is what in your opinion is your favorite game of them all that you've played and your favorite boss from the whole series oof that's actually i should uh sorry my camera is playing okay. again <laughs> with me <laughs> um that's something i should i should have the list of bosses to be honest let me think a little bit my favorite I have to say, this is also something very curious because I told you I rate every game, I give a good score to every game. And I have the feeling that um, I, I enjoy Dark Souls 2 more than Dark Souls 1. Mm -hmm. But then when I give the, the a good score to Dark Souls 2, it was lower than Dark mm -hmm. Souls 1. And I was commenting this with Porto and then he said, like, that makes sense because I can see how Dark Souls 2 was a more fun game to play, but Dark Souls 1 was a better game. Mm. in quality or like originality when it comes to something like that so maybe that's why my subconscious gave it a higher score to Dark Souls 1 Interesting. Uh, um, my favorite I, I have to go I have to go with uh, Bloodborne yes. Um, yes I have to go to Bloodborne and it's a little bit unfair I believe for the other games but it was my first one and always the first one gets like a little bit more of like like love but I was uh, the 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 atmosphere is the atmosphere for, for me it's like how dark it is like i wouldn't even say dark i would say purple <laughs> it's kind of this this kind of um it's like a horror gothic. game yeah it's like a horror game but it's not totally a horror game right. it's like it's a souls game like and it's, it's i don't know it it's really 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 an atmosphere that i i enjoy in a game like i like this kind of gothic creepy like um dark kind of scenario so uh, I, it resonates much more with me than for example like warriors you know when you think about mm. epic fantasy like all like the, these huge battles with uh, armor and like knights it doesn't resonate so much with me for me it's much more like like uh, magic or like you know so I think in that sense Bloodborne was a little bit more like kind of dark and mysterious so I have to go with that one because of the atmosphere yeah I have to say, I, I didn't fully enjoy the, the platform experience because I didn't stream it. I summon people continuously. I never get to, like, you know, go through the hardship of doing the game by myself. I always was summoning people yeah. because I thought that was how it should be played. I mean, <laughs> right, it can right. be played anyway, right? Like, you right. can summon it. it. It's there to use it. Um, but yeah, like, um, I want to replay actually at some point, trying to finish it just 
by myself. So, but yeah, Bloodborne would be my favorite, but for favorite boss, um, I'm gonna say Genichiro. Oh, from uh, Sekiro? Yes. Ooh. Because you don't know this yet. Is, is he the one <laughs> at the Genichiro... entrance? Like he like screams when he like en or comes into uh, the battlefield? No. No, a different one, okay. No, not that one. It's, it's, it's a little bit farther than that one. Yeah, yeah. But Genichiro is, is the, the boss that teaches you how to play Sekiro. Gotcha, gotcha. There is a before and after Genichiro. So <laughs> wall. before you are just like, let's say Dark Soul, Dark Soul in the game. Mm. <laughs> like you are using your Dark Souls strategies. But then Genichiro comes and say like, this is not going to work here. Yeah. Uh, you need to learn how to play Sekiro like parry. properly. And then the parrying, yes. And then after you defeat Genichiro, you feel so good. It, it It's... Actually, up to recently, was the boss that killed me the most in a mm. Souls game. I think it was over 60 or 70 times. Wow. Um, yes, it took me, like, I couldn't finish the full stream. I didn't finish it. It was full stream only dying to Genichiro. Yeah. <laughs> but recently it was actually the Dark Souls um, 3 DLC. I mm. found another, another boss that uh, killed me more. <laughs> well, very fun boss, too. But I, I will go with Genichiro because of what it teaches you so I, yeah. I will choose that one i think one the one of the reasons i love talking to everybody about their soulsborne game favorite soulsborne game favorite like boss or enemy in that game or in the series is everyone is always so different for someone who struggled a lot with one boss somebody else first timed it and struggled with a different kind of boss so there's so many ways to play the games there's so many different types of weapons and magic to use and then there's so many different types of bosses that do different things that will make different kinds of players struggle so um i know like with demon souls a lot of people said they struggled with flame lurker and i think i got flame lurker like first or second try it was wasn't that bad you struggled with it i hate you i hate you <laughs> see i think i used magic though i just kind of like kept circling around him and just kept shooting him with magic and i'm like i guess this works but yeah everybody has like depending on the build you go for or the style um i also like thought orphan of cause was not that bad it was like two times and i got him but then I spent like 30 times trying to fight on Magdala and super struggled with with Amy. So it's it's so different per person. So what for uh, Fire Locker was for you? For me was Bloodborne, the second um, second boss of Bloodborne, like the, the guy in the cemetery. Papa G, yeah, Father Gascoigne. I, I, I didn't die. I killed him first try. Wow, really? And I didn't summon anyone, like, I didn't actually know what happened there in that fight. I, my game might have glitched, because everyone keep on saying it's very hard, and I was like, really? Like, I just enter the cemetery, kill him, and leave. Yeah, <laughs> so, like a boss. <laughs> I it took so, me, like, ten I, times with him. Yeah, like, I don't know, like, I didn't die even once, so I think that's, for me, the one I can show off, kind of crazy. <laughs> Not too shabby. You like look at the camera and you're like, you all said this game was going to be hard. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that, unfortunately, I didn't stream that game. So at that time, oh. I, I couldn't even show off in a stream. Yeah. But it happened. I promise it happened. <laughs> uh, Papa, Papa G is a hard one. I felt like that was the wall of the game where it was like, kind of what you're talking about with Sekiro. Like, this is the enemy that will teach you how to play this game effectively. Um, so being able to first try, I thought that that's super impressive. Yeah, I mean, I'm proud of that one. Then I died a lot after that, but... <laughs> what would you say is your hype level for Elden Ring, out of curiosity? Oof, this is the thing. I promise, after Cyberpunk, I promise myself never to be hyped again. <laughs> like, uh, do you know the movie? God is my witness! I will never be hyped <laughs> again. So, so fair, something fair like Fair enough, that. fair enough. <laughs> no, but actually, I'm very hyped. Uh, the thing is, like... Um, I never learned, you know, you get disappointed and then you, you go back to do the same thing. Right. <laughs> so I'm, I have very high uh, expectations for Elden Ring and I I'm actually want to do a challenge run. I would like to do a blind playthrough and then after do either speed run or deathless or something like that. that uh, I'm sure the, yeah, I think the community is going to be very spicy at that time because the game is going to be released and everyone is going to be very excited. So I think it's going to be good to ride that wave. <laughs> of excitement so yeah but i'm very excited because 
it's supposed to lead, it's supposed to be very open world. So right. you know, like Dark Souls are kind of open. You can go this path or this path, but there is a linear order. to them. Yes, that you need to follow. Kind of like there are optional areas that you can go at any time, but most of it's linear. So I'm really looking forward to see how this plays into like you know open world, like have your horse that looks very ghibli. Yeah. To, like that order disappears. So um, I'm hyped. Like let's say only just twelve out of ten. Twelve out of ten. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's gonna. It looks like it's gonna be Breath of the Wild meets like Dark Souls three, and I'm super excited for it. Yeah, it looks like a little bit more Dark Souls than like you know they they did Bloodborne and then Sekiro, but it looks like they went a little bit back to. It, it's an open world Dark Souls, I believe. It's gonna be. But it looks yeah. like. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for it. I feel like from software, they haven't really released like a bad game since they started with Demon Souls. Like all of the games, whereas like, you know, CD Projekt Red, they did. I'm not as familiar with them, but The Witcher 3 seemed to be their magnum opus catalyst that skyrocketed them. Um, and that was, do they have any other titles that are on par with that? Because at least from soft, like they have you know, Dark Souls 1 was a huge hit. Dark Souls 3 was huge. Bloodborne was huge. Sekiro was huge. So I don't know. Does I don't, I don't know if uh, CD Projekt Red had as similar stratosphere type of titles to kind of ride the wave on. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, that's... Uh, hopefully. That's actually... I've, I've talked to a few people about like Final Fantasy in that regard. One of the things I love so much about Square Enix back in the day that they did so well is they would just make a great game like a Final Fantasy VI, knock it out of the park, absolutely do as the best job they can, and then they just moved on. Then they would just like move on to seven and and just be like, that was a great game, but it's over. We're not touching it again. We're moving on. And then they do seven, and they kind of did that with seven. They did come back to, to it years later, but like they made a great game in seven, moved on to eight, made a great game in eight, moved on to nine, and they just kept going forward in like each project. And I really love that about them and. That's why some people say they really want a Bloodborne 2. And I really wouldn't be upset if they never did a Bloodborne 2 because they kind of captured this magic or lightning in a bottle, if you will. This like amazing game. And if they don't touch it, if they just move on, it can stand the test of time, I feel like. What do you feel about that? Do you do you like when they keep coming out with sequels after sequels? Or do you like when they just kind of do one good game and then leave it, don't touch it, move on to the next thing? Can, before answering, I can help myself from noticing that you stopped at Final Fantasy IX when you were talking about them not coming <laughs> back. They <laughs> tend to have because, too, so. <laughs> that people don't appreciate much. I actually enjoy <laughs> them too. But, um, well, I have mixed feelings about that. I don't think it's a black or white situation in, in this sense because I think uh, if your drive for making a sequel is the money, then I would go for like no because if you don't have the story or the passion like i read i heard or read some somewhere recently like they asked someone to do a, an extra game and then they said like no but the the story is finished and then they were like no but please do it and then the second part wasn't that good i don't know what mm. game was it but yeah it's Not i just heard part it, like, two. <laughs> no <that's, laughs> I that no, it was another game. game i liked it too a lot yes um but no, there was another game that um, it doesn't come to me now. But someone the money. They, they said the, the story is finished, but then the the company was no. But you, we want you to do another one, and then at the end they eventually did. But the game wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. I think if, if that's the case, you know, if the the creators they feel like Bloodborne story is done and there is nothing else to tell, then don't do it. Um, I prefer just to have Bloodborne as it is. Now if they feel like they can do a great job and they have an idea and they will have a story to tell then by all means give us the second part because take my money right like i will i will take it right. uh and, and that's the that's the case with final Fantasy, with now this topic can be applied right to remasters and remakes like they are popping up everywhere I, not only in video games in movies too right like with disney and and I have friends with very strong opinions say like this is killing creativity creativity and this and that. But I'm, I'm not so sure. Like you can you you know you can be involved in a new project and at the same time later being involved in a remake and do a great job in both. And um for Final Fantasy VII remake, I think they are they are doing a great job because there was a lot of expectations to leave. Like it was the best game for many people and I think they are 
they are putting a lot of care and passion and even if may, they make mistakes you can see the passion and you can see the drive that, that, that they want to tell the story in a new way yes. and no spoilers but yes <laughs> there is that so um i i, I it, that's my answer my answer is if there is a drive a creation drive like story to tell then go for second parts go for remakes if you want if it's a good quality and if you, as a consumer, if you don't want it, just ignore it. Like just, you know, like if you don't want Bloodborne 2 and it happens, just imagine it that doesn't exist. Right. And imagine Final Fantasy VII Remake doesn't exist if you don't want it. Like you can always, you know, just ignore play that the, kind of Play the OG. Hope. Yes, play the original, yeah. Um, Still holds it's up. It's going to be there always for you, yes. Right. Um, so that's kind of my opinion. Now, I have a strong opinion in like just making remakes out of or remaster like low quality remasters like mm. out of like just making money like i'm very critical of what happened with the mario games like which the three games that were released like oh, one yeah, year ago for the time period and then they got taken off the shelves and um, and the it was full okay it was like full price for three ga three games yeah but those games they, those games already made the money that they needed to make. Like they already sold really well. Right. They were games that they needed practically no work. Like they just they just copied the ROM into the <laughs> into the Switch, uh, and and for them to charge full price for those three games, I just feel like that's not fair for the consumer and like for people who want to replay those games in the new console. Um, so in that sense, I would say like no, we don't need that. Like we don't need that kind of. Uh, but when there's a new story to, to tell or like reimagination of a story, a remake, then yes, I, I, I would say yes. How do you feel about Nintendo doing the expansion thing on their online to include the N64 games? Did you hear about that recently? I, I, I saw it, yes. I, really, I, I have mixed feelings too because I really want to play those games because I never had a Nintendo 64, but now I have a Switch. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity for me to play those. I just, I, it's going to be more expensive, right? I'm assuming. I didn't see the price thing, but... I don't think they released the price yet, but yeah, it's probably going to be more. Uh, that's the thing. I, Sony does that too. Like, to play online, you need to play, to have PlayStation Plus to play games online, many of the games. Right. Nintendo is going that way too, like, to have online. And then all these games are going to be locked under this, like, monthly payment. Right. So now you don't only pay for the game, like um you're not paying for games that are new you you pay like one game but now you have to pay monthly if you want to so yeah. i have very mixed feelings about those things how they work in in a from a consumer point of view and um yeah i i do want those games yes i think it's way easier than they are making like the like, oh come on nintendo they could have released those games a long time ago it's mm -hmm. way easy yeah, and they are doing it very slowly under like paywalls so I, i'm very critical of that but at the same time i a little bit happy because i want them right. so there is there is this kind of feeling yeah i'm sure they talked about that they're like with the mario games in particular like how much should we charge and it's like if we did charge full price for them how many people would buy it and i'm, I'm sure it was just like there will probably be some people who are upset but they'll still pay 60 dollars and buy it and I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, it's just all about the money. Like the very final, like finite of everything. It's all about getting, you know, those dollars and cents. So I get it, but I don't get it. I'm, I'm like you, I'm very mixed on it. I understand kind of why they're doing it, but it's like, I don't know. Sometimes it just feels like every single thing out there in the universe is just trying to grab each one of us and squeeze all the money out of us. And it's <laughs> yes. like, but I mean, that's just how, that's just how the capitalistic world economy works you know and it's you can be upset about it but i don't know it almost feels like fighting against a giant tidal wave that's you know you can either go with the tide or go against it and if you go against it it's gonna crush you <laughs> it's, it's, it's gonna be tough let's right. be honest yeah like, no it's, 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 it's fighting a giant like uh, my, my point of view is like uh, it comes to many things like you know recycling climate change you know there are individual uh th th this comes the video of Curses tag was related to that theme, like how individual actions, how much affect big the big picture of things. And it comes to capitalism, like how much me not buying Mario All-Stars affected Nintendo? Nothing. I didn't buy and Nintendo didn't care. Like, right, you right, know, right. <laughs> there is no, there is no effect. 
Um, I think that there is other, like, from a consumer point of view, it's really hard to just go on a strike and say, like, let's not buy this game because it's unfair, uh, unfair price. So I don't think we should, like, you know, be too harsh on us, like, I bought this game. Like, you know, if you bought Mario All-Stars, by all means, enjoy it. Right. I'm not criticizing you as a consumer. I'm more criticizing, like, their greed because I believe those games already made a lot of money and they didn't need to charge. You know, as a company, you could also be kind of kind and say, like, you know, these already made money. We can just sell them for... I'm sure selling them for $20 would still make them money yeah. and not be, like, $60, you know? So you could still be, like... It just feels like a little bit too much sometimes. And speaking of, I have a big complaint about Nintendo that I was going to do a post in Twitter and I eventually I never did because I was busy with the moving. Nintendo just um, activated Bluetooth yes. in the Switch. It was there this whole time. <laughs> it was there the whole time. <laughs> I've heard it doesn't work reason? too well, though. I've heard a lot of people have been having disconnecting issues on it. Have you had any of those issues? So this is the thing, like, uh, two years ago, my birthday present was a USB adapter oh, gotcha. for Bluetooth. So yeah. I actually was connecting to my uh, wireless headphones through this adapter. That was my birthday present. So I've been using that. It works really well. But I was kind of shocked that they had that capability within the console and it was never activated only four years after release yeah. it's like come on nintendo <laughs> that's the most I, I feel like if any company would do that it would be nintendo and i don't know why um it'd be cool if they kind of sold if they had like bluetooth headphones that would work with the switch kind of the way um like with iphone specifically if you have airpods literally just open the case pop your earbuds in and they just automatically know that to connect to your phone to connect to whatever media you're playing so you can just be watching a youtube video pop them in and they just automatically start working it'd be cool if the nintendo switch had their own kind of headphones like that that you could buy maybe where you just sit down turn the nintendo switch on put the headphones on and it's like oh i know you have the headphones on i know the switch is turned on they're automatically connected you're automatically good to go that'd be pretty cool i feel like but then it would also be uh, probably another hundred or two hundred dollars that people would have to spend on headphones so wait doesn't all the wireless earphones do that uh, i think some of them you have to go at least some of the ones that i've used previously you have to go into settings and like connect it specifically um it doesn't just like automatically pair right away when it's turned on so a couple extra steps to it um the thing with the apple ones that work really nice is they just you don't even have to go into settings they just automatically connect and the connection on them because they're proprietary does stay really strong but i'm not even saying like that would be the best solution but I, maybe maybe an idea like with own proprietary like nintendo it. switch headphones yeah them. if they were good if they're good um but then um... Yeah, like I'm curious how because now my head, my earphones, the ones I use, I use for them for everything. But basically, I have to go into settings to pair them first time. Right. But then after that, they connect automatically Ooh, to okay. the switch. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, like or to the phone. They only connect to one thing though. So if right. I'm connected to the phone, they won't connect to anything else. But it's let's say um, I have the switch on and then I put them on, then they will connect with the switch. That's cool. Automatically. That's but cool. you have to pair them first time. Right. And you need the USB adapter. <laughs> the one thing, um, like with the AirPods, with the iPhones I love. So I have like my iPad right in front of me always. And then I have my phone. So if I'm watching something on my phone, it'll play. But then if I just go straight to my iPad and click like a different video or Spotify or Twitch, my headphones know that now my attention is turned to the iPad and it will switch the audio automatically. Oh, so don't oh, have to go really? into settings or anything. Or then if I go out into a living room and we have an Apple TV and I just start playing something, it'll be like, oh, now he's watching TV. We're going to switch the audio automatically over there. So they like bounce back and forth really, really, really well. And you don't have to interfere or touch with anything. Okay, mine not, don't do that. No. <laughs> we just got, um for my birthday uh, a couple days ago, my wife got us both the brand new like Apple Air airpod mac i don't know the the new headphones they released and we've been we've been playing with them today and they work just like that it's crazy like just watching stuff on the tv they'll play wirelessly with the tv and they're paired with each other so we've been watching like tv shows today with like amazing audio wireless the two of us in sync everything's wireless and then i'll just go down on my phone and like click a video on twitter and just the it just syncs right away to it so i'm like that's 
that's pretty cool everything is just so easy and fluid it's just I really that's one thing about Apple products that I've always loved is just how well the ecosystem works with each other I mean yeah they are created for it's <laughs> right. only one one brand so they better work with each other right right they're not it's like I, I mean I was telling my wife this today I'm like I feel like they make the best products on earth sometimes but they just don't work with anything else except in their <laughs> ecosystem so it's like if you're in the Apple ecosystem you're gonna love these headphones because they're amazing if you're outside of it sorry you're not our customer <laughs> right, right. so it is kind of like an all or nothing type of dive in which i get why some people absolutely hate that but if you you're in the ecosystem hate, it's yeah yeah you know hate is not a strong word <laughs> they're Apple's like i don't hate them but i don't use them because i don't have apple yeah yeah they're 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 interesting products like they're they work great. I, I love their interface. I love the software. I just love how everything interconnects with each other. Um, and this is coming from somebody that uses a PC to stream and like do all of my work stuff like on my PC. <laughs> but yeah, the the phone, the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple have everything just works so seamlessly together. It's it's. I don't know if I could ever give that up. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty. No, you don't have to. You don't have to. Right. Right. And I have what, the what? Whatever it works for you right right i used to work in cell phones um and i swapped around with like some samsung phones i tried out or some like one plus phones or the google pixel phones and and they're all i feel especially nowadays with windows and mac and like android and iphone they're so old and evolved at this point now that they're both great options regardless of which one you go for like i'm, all, I'm always been a uh, android well actually i had an iphone I thought iPhone 4, maybe? Oh, okay, maybe yeah. it was a long time ago. And it was really good, I must say. It lasted, it's the phone that has lasted me the longest. <laughs> uh, it lasted a lot. Uh, but then I, I went to um, Android because I really wanted to like um, customize like the interface and many things that Apple doesn't allow you. So, And since then, I, I stayed with Android be, just because of that. Like I know that Apple products probably last longer than the Androids I have. But I just love to go inside and change things. Configure everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, one question. I did have a couple more questions. Sorry, I just looked over at the time and like two hours turned into two and a half hours very quickly. Just a great conversation. We are rocking we have, it. We are rocking it. I do have a few more though for you, real quick, if you got if you got a second. Um Yes. If you could time travel, kind of, I guess this looks like the icebreaker, but if you could time travel and go back in the past and tell your day one streaming self a solid piece of advice, what would you tell yourself out of curiosity? Um, okay, to the day one streamer, <laughs> uh, I would say... That's the kind of, I need to think that one, what, I don't know, it's, it's really hard, right? Because There's I don't think I have made, like a lot of mistakes during this Or like year. advice maybe. Uh, um, yeah, I was thinking in the sense of don't do that, but I was like, did I do something that I shouldn't have? I don't know. Um, <laughs> an advice would be like, um, maybe get into Lear and Bolt as soon as possible. Because mm -hmm. I believe that's what took my stream to, to like the next level, like kind of interaction with chat and let people do things in, in the stream, like kind of learn that yeah. uh, a little bit earlier, maybe, um, which I eventually did. But um, I would say like also like do um, like Fire Fantasy speedrun, yes, like go for it. Like um, that was also really cool. And a lot of Souls games. I think for, from a point of view of what has helped the stream grow, it's been like dedication into like make it more interactive. Uh, Final Fantasy VIII speedrun and um, Dark Souls games, probably oh, Hollow Knight, Dark Souls game. Yeah. I think those are the things that probably has. You see, I've been streaming how long? Like one year and four months or so. So I think those things were the things that I could see. It's difficult to see how what is affecting the growth sometimes because there are maybe moving factors. But I think right. those games 
with me putting time in like every week trying to like improve a little bit of the stream probably that that thing i would say to um myself and also uh buy a pc get a pc <laughs> yes yeah. yes i used to stream off of my laptop and it was oh it was i mean it got the job done but yeah once i moved and got like a desktop tower still had some problems with it but i think that was more of a me thing but now everything is just it just works i don't have very you know i say i say i don't have any problems as my stream literally crashed yesterday so less problems <laughs> i should say less problems yeah <laughs> um yeah, be, be, yeah people if you feel better my internet is flawless in japan like the internet is amazing yeah and um, the only time I had an internet problem where my connection dropped was during my first Final Fantasy VIII speedrun. Oh no! In the middle of the speedrun. But there is a, a silver lining is that, you know like how you have in Twitch like your like achievements? Like, yeah. get, like get 50 people talking at the same time. Right, right. So because of my stream crashed, everyone started chatting at the same time. Oh. So I got an achievement unlock because I got like 50 people talking at the same time. That's awesome. <laughs> So, a little hack uh, right there for everybody. Like, you need to get the achievements. You know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone like chat at the same time. Like talk about. I think people do like um, those games that people have to chat at the same time. Like Words Marvel on stream. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Like I do that, but I don't do. I don't play it also. I never got that achievement. So yeah, my internet crashed. But I normally don't have many problems. My camera is, is the only thing I bought new and it's acting up a little bit. So hmm. that's the only thing. Yeah, if it if it's if you don't have some kind of tech problems when you're streaming, like is it really a stream? There's always there's always something. Yes. Um, I mean, there's the always... camera triggers me yeah. because it's like I lose ten or fifteen minutes every stream setting up. Mm. That would be annoying for sure. I'm a sucker for convenience, so even if like when I was looking at lights to buy, I ended up going for the Elgato lights just because I could easily tie them in with my stream deck and click one button and like everything turns on. So I'm like, I, I would rather pay more money just for easy convenience where I can click a button, everything's up and I never have to think about it. Same with my camera, like just getting my camera mounted to my, mounted to my table. So I never have to set it up and it's just there. Just makes life so much easier, but you gotta pay. I mean, sometimes, sometimes convenience is a little bit more expensive, but I'm a sucker for paying for convenience for sure. So now I actually like uh, I have the microphone like you hanging from. I, I'm assuming you have it like connected to the like my, my to the table. Yeah. yeah. Boom so on. I have it like that, um, like the arm. But now I actually just have it standing on the desk. I think that might be. I'd be better just because of the cable management because mm. the, it was a little bit difficult to also my screen's a little bit big so I don't know if I have space for the arm so I might take uh, your advice and maybe just set the, because the camera is on top of the screen but I might set it on the table to me yeah and that's the fun thing about like sometimes I feel like people don't understand the creativeness of streaming there's so many different elements that we can have from our background to how we set up our microphone to our camera to our whole overlay setup like there's so many components put together that can really make you you when it comes to streaming it, it makes every stream unique in a sense so much work behind yes yes anyone anyone that thinks it's literally just clicking go live and playing video games i mean you can do that but most people kind of go that extra mile and really spend a lot of time in obs and browser sources and widgets and really Leorn board. You know, I've talked to so many people, Leorn board is a, is a handful to kind of get set up. But once you get it set up, it, it works great. So there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Or you get, or you get to Sana Sugar and Siada and they help you set it up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> August hacks right the there, trick. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, Some things I did by myself, okay? Some things I asked for advice. There's nothing ever wrong with asking for, for help or asking questions for sure. So yeah. I, I, I completely agree. I also think it's really good to sometimes tinker yourself and sometimes press buttons and, and read, read rules and just kind of like try to figure it out yourself. And then sometimes if you can't figure it out, that's where reaching out to a friend comes in handy. I have a couple people on, on Twitch that are just computer geniuses i swear that that i've reached out to and asked questions about and they've been super super helpful for sure uh, kudos to those people who actually yes. help without like asking anything on it shout out back. to the techies you're so immensely appreciated yes. everybody 
Thank you so much. One other one I got for you. What is one thing that you absolutely have loved about streaming on Twitch, August? Oh, this is gonna be cliche as well, right? Like meeting people, making friends. It's not about the it's not about the ending. It's about the friends you will make in the journey. Like <laughs> it sounds very cliche, I know. Um, but what I have loved, well, let's say uh, let's let's give something else. So it's not the same answer that everyone. I don't know if everyone has said that to you, but uh, I'm assuming it's a very popular so one. Have, yeah. Um, but. Yeah, honestly, like I, I move through like human relations. Like I'm very social. I, I like to to talk, as you can see. <laughs> I like to um, have conversations with people. So obviously, that part of Twitch, I really enjoy. Um, but in the other sense, I would say like uh, me learning new things. Like I love the creation. Like you, I, I said, I wanted to do a podcast, but Twitch equally. Like you know, I have learned so many things. I have learned how to use OBS. I have learned how to use Photoshop, like just a little bit, but you know, I had zero Photoshop skills before. Now I know how to move things around. Uh, I have learned how to use Lear on board. I have learned like it, which means like a little bit of like coding, like like uh, soft coding, let's say. Um, I don't know. I have learned many skills that who knows? I might use, I might not use in the future, but uh, I'm using right now. so um that's good enough um so I, I would say that like meeting people and learning a lot of skills yes both of those are great answers because yeah the first part absolutely true i feel like most people i've talked to relationships community meeting new people has been such a critical aspect of the entire twitch experience and using that critical thinking part of your brain and like solving tech problems and learning new things and like i want to do this I wonder how I do it. I'm going to do some research and try to figure it out. And that leads you like the breadcrumbs kind of lead you to Lior and board or, or like figuring out microphones and, and OBS settings and, and all filters and stuff like that. So I, I love those. Those are great answers. Conversely though, what is one thing you do not enjoy about streaming on Twitch? <laughs> The hate rate? No, I, I didn't have like actually any hate rate, uh, fortunately. Uh, I had the host following me, but not like ready. Uh, um, one thing I don't enjoy about Twitch is, uh, this is going to be a little bit kind of political, I guess, or controversial, I don't know. But it's like, you know, the, the capitalistic society, it kind of drips into like how we, Twitch works. And I get it, Twitch is a company like any other, so they want to make profit. But you know, there is all this secretism, like how partners don't cannot say certain things when they become partner. Like, uh, um, I don't know if you follow, uh, what is his name? Harris? Like, there's the Alpha Game. Yes. Yeah. Alpha Game, yes. So he was talking about that in one of his videos recently. And, and I just don't like that much. Like, how, you know, um, it seems like you are partner, you are in a different kind of they treat you like you are in a different kind of... Um, they respect you in a different way, more than if you are affiliate. And like there is this class, right? So, like kind of classes, like in the society or something like that. So I don't like much that, like when they create fi fictional um, walls to make your life more difficult, like giving you just not any emotes until you're affiliate or giving you only five emotes when you're affiliate but when you are partner you have like 30 like literally those for in case people don't know those barriers are invisible like twitch could give anyone 30 emotes if they wanted tomorrow so i don't like those things like you know there is no need for like i believe maybe it is true like for some people it helps them to be more creative um that more to more drive like oh i'm gonna get 30 emotes so let's get to partner but i believe like for 95 percent of the people that's not the reason they keep on working on twitch and like making content so like you know you don't have to be so stingy when it comes to <laughs> to releasing like uh, features to the affiliates and keeping them for the partners or whatever. So that part I don't enjoy much. Like I think they could do a better job, like providing tools for us and, and yeah, not creating these two classes of people. Do you think it'd be different if there was like a middle class between affiliate and partner? Like if there was pre-partner or like affiliate plus, do you think that would be better? Or do you think just 
there shouldn't be either one or maybe because i know when you reach partner the emote slots don't just immediately unlock you have to have like certain you have to hit a certain amount of subs and then you get like the next one unlocked and the next one so maybe if that wasn't restricted to partners you could be an affiliate and still have multiple emote slots based on subs or something i feel like that would be a little bit better like yeah like okay i can i can see how you say like oh you have 50 subs so you need five Five emotes modes. and then you have 60 fabs 60 you can have six i could say that would make more sense because it means your channel is growing right but the the, the limitation of just like say, oh you're affiliate so even if you have 300 subs because i know affiliates with 300 subs mm -hmm. you are you are still, still stuck five. with five emotes right, right. <laughs> so i feel like those are imaginary like kind of walls that they are putting on us and uh, yeah i don't know if make creating a middle class would be better i would have to see how that is implemented so i'm, I'm open to possibilities i wonder if so, they do that okay. though if they separate them like that to give affiliates a reason to want to reach for partner because if, if it if there is no difference or if there aren't any of those walls there then maybe some affiliates might not strive and push as hard to reach partner they almost feel like once they hit partner then there's rewards then there's like transcoding they get I think Twitch Turbo, they get the emotes, they get the check mark, they kind of get like a, a treasure trove of things once they actually hit that. Whereas if none of that was really there, or maybe it could have been trickled down to affiliates, there wouldn't be as much of a push to reach for it, maybe. I wonder if yeah, that's their thought. I, I, I understand. I think some of them are true. Some might be like, you know, you can have Stretch. the check mark saying, indicating that, okay, your channel has reached average viewership of 75 people mm. so you have that check mark so you know you have that kind of thing that people know that your your channel is big if you need that dog. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you can you can opt out you can remove right. it i think but like something like that you know um you can have there are some things that could be say like oh when you reach certain viewership or certain thing you get some like the same thing when you get affiliate you have like extra vip badges when you get some art, un unlock some achievements i think they they could keep doing that without having the partnership differentiation right like let's say like you just get the check mark at 75 viewership and you get uh 10 emotes at 100 subs and um, like it goes like that you know i don't know if that would be better like i don't know how much people need to I guess re people really push when you are at 50 average viewers, you really feel the urge to push to 75. The push for partner thing. Yeah. Yes, I guess there are some people who really push for that, but I think for most of the people, once you reach partner or when you are low below, I don't think that makes much a difference for how much you are pushing to be honest. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like um, I, that whole push for partner thing almost does more harm than it does for good for a lot of people. Um, yeah, just because you're almost, I don't want to say begging, but it just kind of is, is like almost begging kind of in a way. You're begging yeah. for, for like when people are going on Twitch and they're like, which one of my favorite streamers do I want to hang out with today? Oh, this one's doing a partner push. Maybe I should ex give them extra special attention. And and I don't know. I don't know. But like, yeah, I just, I, 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 so, and I feel kind of the same way sometimes with stream teams where it seems like it's so common for people to want to join a stream team on Twitch and a lot of the stream teams seem to be very focused on helping the creator of the stream team rather than helping those who are a part of the entirety of the team so I don't know they're definitely kind of what you're saying there's some things that trickle into Twitch from the outside world I definitely sense a lot of that for sure yeah um yeah and yeah, i rather like the creation of like you know two kind of classes like mm -hmm. affiliate and partner and then if you are part like I, you know i know people who are partner and who became partner before like i met them as affiliate they became partner or whatever yeah and i know they are the same people you know it's, it's nothing nothing changed and they actually say like after you become partner not much changes like yes they have like this life um sub they can give to someone or they have mm -hmm. like the check mark they have some things like, like they can change their name easily right. um there are some things you have which are nice um but i don't know is it needed is it like doing maybe it's doing more harm to the communities or like to the mental health of like i need to reach that goal and right. then i don't know if the reward is good enough to to like rush so much together i don't know there's a lot of really... <laughs> or sorry what were we gonna say <laughs> 
Yeah, like for me, like I would really want to grow my channel, but not because I want to be partnered, because I just want to grow it. Like, you know, like right. um, I don't think for me, partnership makes much sense. Like I mean, what they want to do, like people pushing to be partnered, like it doesn't, um, my type of personality, it doesn't encourage me so much, but I guess it works for other people because they have it implemented and I guess they have done their analysis and their studies and they know how it, how it works. So yeah. I think that's one of the cool things though about streaming on Twitch is there's so many people who stream for different reasons. Some people just want to stream on Twitch to play games with their friends and to make friends and other people stream because they want to turn it into a full-time career and, and make money from it and build, a, you know, a, a real brand image from it and build, you know, an influencer platform off of it. So there's so many different ways to stream reasons to stream. I don't know if, I don't really think any are worse or better than others except people who like manipulate people for money and don't do that at all um don't don't do that at all but yeah people who who come to stream for a career who stream to make friends who stream just to play video games and if people want to watch them play cool if not cool i think there's a lot of a lot of uh different kinds of people that twitch brings together and we're all here just to to put our best foot forward and to just have fun and and to make friends for sure like I, I don't um it doesn't matter what you want to do with your channel as long as you are nice with everyone i believe yeah. and then after that it's just your own personal you know whatever you want to in my case i obviously want to like grow my channel i see it as a fun hobby and as i like kind of hustle like kind of you know part-time job let's say yeah. like I, I i honestly put the dedication of a part-time job so it, it feels like that, but it's a fun thing to do. Like, you know, if regardless of how much money I make or not or whatever, I still would do it because it's fun and I really enjoy and it's what I was saying before, the skills I learned. So I think um, that's why for me it doesn't resonate so much the partnership thing, I believe. But yeah, maybe for other people they, it, it does, but yes. Um, it would be great. That said, if I get partner, I would be very happy. So, <laughs> um, no, I, I think you're a hundred percent right. You know, I just think I really resonate with the whole side hustle kind of idea, idea of it a little bit, because like some people drive Uber for a side money. Some people babysit for side money. Some people stream on Twitch, you know, and make good enough content to where they can have it be a great part-time little side hustle. Um, I, I think for most people, it works way better as a part-time side hustle. Cause I mean, at least speaking from a United States citizen perspective, there's no healthcare coverage on it. There's no like dental or like any of any of that stuff. There's no PTO and pay time away. And there's no, there, there's a lot of, it's very much more of like a contracting kind of thing, similar to Uber versus it being like working part-time at like Starbucks or something. Um, but I think there's a lot of creative flexibility that comes with it. There's a lot of opportunity to meet incredible people from all around the world, from different cultures and different languages and to like, that's it, That's my favorite thing, honestly, is meeting people like you and Porto and Carrion and Fortune and just people from all around the world who live in different areas and speak different languages and eat different foods and think different things and just, we come, we find something that resonates with both of us, whether it be like a video game we love that, that shares or, or movies or anime or whatever. And then that just forms a friendship. It's, it's like, I've always felt the game on Twitch or your content or whatever you're doing is like the middle ground. And if you're playing Sekiro and somebody loves Sekiro and you're playing it, it's just a great way to form a, a friendship right there, like to develop that yeah. relationship. So there's a lot of pros to it. I would definitely tell people, don't be worried about the one percent assholes who come in and the hosses and the hate raids and the the backseaters those are very much in the minority 99 percent of people on twitch are are good people i feel like like in the world yeah like most of the people are nice but like the the, the bad people make out of noise but you have to learn how to deal with them and then just focus on the positive completely agree 100 percent. last two questions i got for you my friend in your own words, what does streaming mean to you, August? Oh, wow. I think that's, I kind of answered that maybe before. What streaming? Through all of this. Uh, well, uh, let's, let's actually say something new. 
<laughs> for me, it means entertaining. Uh, um, I think that's because I always was the entertainer, like in my group of friends. Like I always was the joker. Like I was um, trying to lift up the mood, uh, be nice with everyone like yeah like even when we met new people i was always, always trying to break the ice with the new people who came into the room make them feel part of it by joking so i like that part of entertaining and like you know i was wearing like lady gaga like um like costume when it was my birthday to oh, yeah. entertain everyone so i was kind of uh that long time before twitch was created like when i was very young and I don't know, like, I guess that is what Twitch means for me, like being the entertaining entertainer, try to create good moments for people, like try to make the stream um, fun for everyone to hang out. Yeah, like also like a safe space, like to ask a like, member of LGBTQ plus community, obviously, I like my stream to be like a safe space for everyone. And um, yeah, like that's what it means. Like it needs to entertain probably. I would say entertaining is absolutely a huge part of Twitch. And I think you do an excellent job with your streams. Um, every time I get to hang out a lot of times when you're streaming is like right when I wake up at six in the morning, getting my stuff ready. But I usually have my iPad in front of me and I'm kind of like lurking in either your stream or, you know, a couple other friends streams. So every time I'm, I'm in there and get a chance to chat or get a chance to lurk, you always have such good energy, such big smiles. You're just like always so I love just hanging out with people that you can just censor good hearted people who just want nothing more than to just provide a safe space and just have a good time and laugh a little bit, joke a little bit, have a good time. That's what it's all about. I feel like. Yeah. If I make someone's day is a little bit happier, that's amazing. Absolutely. You definitely make my day a lot better. I'll hundred percent tell you that. And it's the beginning of the day, Surfer, so it's great, right? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Last question though, this one's a big one for everybody. Where can all of our viewers and listeners connect with you online? Well, you can find me at uh, twitch.tv slash aguskunjp. I almost had to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Where was my channel? Um, yeah, and... Um, I have also a Discord. You can find the Discord in my like in the Twitch page. Uh, it's called Angus Land. And I have tweet the most. Act I have an Instagram too, and I created a TikTok, but I never post it. So don't follow me in the TikTok yet. <laughs> I don't know if that's gonna go anywhere. Uh, I think the most active is probably Twitch and Twitter. And Twitter is uh, Angus Kunjp. So yep, I'm there. So it's the same same name. And links to all of those social medias are going to be down in the description below. So 100% be sure to follow August Gun on all of them. I'll have them all linked down there for you, my friends. Thank you all so much for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Zephcast. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. It really does help the channel out a lot. And if you want to see more of your favorite content creators, streamers, and podcasters in the near future, don't forget to subscribe. It's absolutely free to do so. And we'll be having even more exciting content coming up soon. Thank you all again for watching. Zephyr's XP, August Gun JP, and I'll catch you all in the next one, my friends. Subscribe here. Subscribe here. Much love, everybody. I'm with it. <laughs> I'll see you all in the next one. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.